Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 9749 in the name of Margaret Burgess on the Housing Scotland Bill. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And, Minister, if you are ready, I will call on you now to speak to and move your motion, please, in 14 minutes. We are tight for time today, so if we can stick to the times, that would be great. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to open this Stage 1 debate on the principles of the Housing Bill. I thank the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee for their scrutiny of the Bill and for their Stage 1 report on it. I'd also like to thank the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their consideration of the Bill and for their contribution to the Lead Committee's scrutiny of the Bill. And I'm particularly grateful to all of our stakeholders for the considered views they offered the Committee and for the responses to the numerous Scottish Government consultations which helped to shape the policy objectives of the Bill. And the Committee has recognised these consultations were comprehensive and inclusive. I welcome the Committee's conclusion that the Bill provides a package of measures which will contribute to the improvement of housing in the social, private rented and owner-occupied sectors, which captures well what the Government wants to achieve through this Bill. The Committee has made a number of detailed recommendations and comments in its report and has called on the Government to consider and respond to these during the later stages of the Bill's parliamentary scrutiny. The Government is still reflecting on some of these issues at present, but we will set out our position on all of them in our response to the report. In this afternoon's debate, I want to focus on the principles of the Bill and what we want to achieve through it but I'll also address some of the more significant points that the committee has raised. I'll start with the provisions uh, to end the right to buy. This Scottish Government is committed to increasing the supply of social housing, which is why we want to end the right to buy. By doing this, we will keep homes in the social rented sector, increase choice for tenants and people in need of housing, and help social landlords manage their stock more effectively. This measure has been widely supported, and I'm pleased about that. In fact, the majority of stakeholders have told us that right to buy should end sooner than the three years after royal assent that the bill presently provides for, and that has been endorsed and is endorsed by the committee. In light of this, we've looked again at the length of this period and considered whether it does strike the right balance between moving quickly to safeguard homes for rent and giving tenants a fair opportunity to exercise their right to buy should they wish to do so. We have concluded that a period of two years from royal assent strikes a better balance and will therefore bring forward an amendment at stage two to that effect. The bill includes a range of measures. I'll take an intervention. James Kelly. I thank the Minister for uh, taking the intervention. Not opposed to the proposals in the bill in terms of the right to buy, but uh, in relation to the current housing waiting list and 155,000 people on waiting lists, how does she see the proposal to abolish the right to, to buy tackling that? Be, bearing in mind the government's own figures suggest that it would only make a dent of you know 1,500 uh, houses a year in terms of reducing those waiting lists. The proposal in the bill, as I said earlier, the principles we're uh, look, pr pr proposing in this bill is to safeguard the social houses that we currently have, and that's a way of doing it. That goes in conjunction with the, this government's target to increase their supply of affordable housing and to ensure that we have th build a further 30,000 affordable houses by the end of this uh, parliament. And I think, you know, I would remind the member that we're building more uh, houses for social rent now than was built in any previous administration of this parliament and we continue to do that and we will safeguard the houses that we already have uh, by ending the right to buy. The bill includes a range of measures to help social landlords meet housing need and support local communities by giving them more flexibility in how they manage and allocate their housing stock and there's general support from the committee for these measures. And I agree with the committee's recommendations that the government should publish guidance to help landlords use their increased flexibility and I'm more than happy to undertake that we will do so. For example, to provide further clarity around how the antisocial behaviour measures are intended to work in practice. 
I am also aware of the very different views that stakeholders have on Section 5 of the Bill, which would allow landlords to take age into account when they allocate social housing. This was included in the Bill because during the consultation, landlords told us that this measure would enable them to allocate individual properties so that new tenants were helped to sustain their tenancies to the benefit of themselves and their communities. Others, however, have expressed concerns that the provision would introduce the possibility of allocations being, being discriminatory. And I want to place on record that that's not this government's intention, and indeed the section includes explicit safeguards against that possibility. But I respect the different positions that stakeholders hold on this issue. And at a recent meeting of my housing policy advisory group, the opposing arguments were explored and debated and from it, it was clear to me that everyone is united in wanting to achieve the best outcomes for communities and for those in housing need. So I am now carefully considering everything that has been said on this matter and hope to set out the Government's position in my response to the Committee's Stage 1 report of the Bill. There has been widespread support for the transfer of private rented sector cases from the Sheriff to a tribunal. This will enable greater specialism and access to justice for those cases where we have heard that both landlords and tenants can be reluctant to use the courts. There is significant interest in the operational detail of the tribunal, for example in relation to access and representation, and this will largely be set by secondary legislation. Some representatives of the social rented sector express disappointment that cases relating to that sector are not being transferred to the tribunal. The government believes that improved, spe improved specialism and procedures enabled by the Court's Reform Bill will improve how cases arising in the social sector are dealt with, but will of course continue to keep the impact of these reforms under review through continuing engagement with stakeholders. And that will include me attending regular housing policy advisory group meetings where I can hear about the issues firsthand. And this group includes representation from social rented tenants CIH, Alacho, Coslo, SFHA and Shelter Scotland. The Bill introduces rights for third parties to report to the Private Rented Housing Panel. These rights will strengthen local authority powers to tackle poor conditions in the private rented sector for the benefit of individuals and communities across Scotland. Again, there is widespread support for this policy. We intend to strengthen the provisions further by bringing forward Stage 2 amendments that will give local authorities a new power of entry in relation to enforcement of the repairing standard. This will give all local authorities in Scotland powers to tackle substandard housing wherever it arises in their areas. We believe that this will be more effective than the proposals for enhanced enforcement areas in tackling such problems. And I know that local authorities have expressed concerns about the potential cost to them of these new powers, but a key feature of the provisions is that they are discretionary. In effect, they offer local authorities an additional tool for tackling substandard housing in a targeted way, where they are satisfied that the cost of intervening are justified by the benefits to tenants and communities. Improving safety standards in private sector housing has received almost unanimous support from stakeholders. And we intend to look at safety standards across all tenures of housing later this year as part of our sustainable housing strategy. But at stage two of this bill, I intend to bring forward an amendment for a regulation making power to make changes to the, the repairing standard for private landlords. I also expect non-government amendments to be brought forward at stage two to require electrical safety checks and the installation of carbon monoxide detectors in private rented housing. I want to see the details of these amendments before making any definite commitments to support them, but I am very sympathetic to these proposals and I hope to be able to amend the bill to reflect them. The committee also highlighted the case for hardwiring smoke detectors. Whilst I agree that this should be the standard for private rented homes, I do not think that we need to legislate for it. There is currently a requirement under Section 20 of the Housing Scotland Act 2006 for any alarm installed or replaced since 2000, September 2007 to be hardwired. As alarms need to be replaced at the end of a manufacturer's recommended lifespan, usually between five and ten years, the desired result will be achieved without further legislation. 
But if there are concerns on this point, they can be picked up through the work we intend to do on cross-tenure standards, which I already mentioned, and if necessary, we can address them through the new regulation-making power that we propose to bring forward at stage two. The Scottish Government is committed to improving standards in the letting agent industry, an industry which has, serves a rapidly expanding private rented housing sector. The provisions in the Bill are intended to give tenants and landlords confidence in a consistent standard of service and easy access to a dispute resolution service. The Bill will achieve these twin aims by setting up a statutory register for letting agents, by developing a statutory code of practice and by creating a new means of redress for tenants and landlords to the new first tier tribunal. And I was pleased to note the broad support for our proposals at the committee's evidence sessions and I also... Un I'll take an intervention. James Kelly. I'll take an, an intervention. I wonder if you can just provide some clarification, if possible, uh, in terms of you know, the regulation of letting agents. If a letting agent is performing in a, an unsatisfactory manner, uh, how can that, under the legislation, can the, the letting agent uh, be removed from the register? Minister Margaret Burgess. Yes, and, and I'll cover that, and I'll certainly cover that later as well, that a, a letting agent not performing or can be reported if they're not um, following the statutory code of, of, of practice, can be reported to the private rented sector um, tribunal, and they certainly can be removed from the register if they don't um, comply with the, the code of practice. Also, if, if they don't meet the fit and proper test, the Scottish Government can remove them from the register as well. I want to be very clear that the, the provisions we're introducing in letting agents will have teeth and we intend to use those teeth to ensure that the sector, the reputation of the sector is improved. And we... Yes, I'll give way. I'm, uh, I'm grateful Patrick to Harvey. the Minister for, for giving way. Um, she says that the regulation of letting agents will have teeth. It's pretty clear that the detail of how it's all going to work is going to be in the code of practice. The committee has recommended that the face of the bill should be used to outline the issues that the code of practice will cover. Does the minister agree with that recommendation? Because if not, it seems hard to see why we should allow a negative procedure to be used to approve the code of practice rather than an affirmative one, which at least gives Parliament some scrutiny powers. Thank you. Minister, two minutes remaining. As I said, we are still looking and will respond to, to the committee's report. But at the moment, um, I, I would just highlight that what we're, we are going to say is that the code of practice will be worked up with, with stakeholders. But we have listened to concerns and we are going to be bringing forward amendments uh, at stage two to require letting agents uh, to require training for letting agents as a condition uh, of registration. So there are a number of things we're looking at to strengthen it, even before we, uh, the code of guidance is, is worked up. <coughs> but we expect the code to cover issues such as professional standards, ethics, professional indemnity, and complaints handling procedures. And we're also considering how the enforcement measures in the bill, uh, which may cover what, what Patrick Harvey mentioned there, could be made more robust and we will address that certainly through amendments at stage two. Our approach to reforming the mobile homes site licensing has also been welcomed by the committee. And as I'm running out of time now, I'll just say a couple of things. We have listened to what the committee and what the industry has said in this, and we would also be bringing forward um, stage two amendments on that. Um, when I gave evidence on the bill to the committee, I said that the government was sympathetic to calls for tenants of a registered social landlord to be balloted before their landlord became part of a group structure with another RSL. We've asked stakeholders for their views on this, and I'm grateful that over 40 took the trouble to respond at what was very short notice. I'm now considering their views and hope to set out the government's definitive position on this matter in our response to the stage one report. Presiding officer, as the committee recognised, the bill is about improving housing across all tenures. It will help us to deliver better outcomes for communities, safeguard the interests of consumers and support improved quali quality across all, across all sectors of housing. And I look forward to working with members across the chamber to secure these objectives as we continue to take the bill through Parliament. I move the motion. Many thanks.
And I now call on Maureen Watt to speak on behalf of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Ten minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee has carried out a comprehensive scrutiny of the Housing Scotland Bill, which, as is ever the case with housing bills, contain a wide variety of proposals. So I will briefly cover how we viewed some of the key provisions in the bill, and I'm sure my colleagues from the committee will pick up on some of them in more detail as the debate progresses this afternoon. Firstly, however, I'd like to extend the committee's thanks to all of the housing stakeholder groups and individuals who provided oral and written evidence on the bill. It is always hugely encouraging for us to witness the passion and commitment of those organisations who genuinely want to see tangible improvements made to social and private re rented housing in this country. I would also like to offer particular thanks to the social housing tenants groups, the housing association representatives, and the officials and councillors from West Dumbartonshire Council for meeting informally with the committee in Dumbarton in February as part of Parliament Day. It was particularly helpful for us to hear at first hand the practical experiences of both tenants and those who manage and operate social housing. We also held a formal meeting in the evening in Dumbarton, which I believe is the first for a committee of the Scottish Parliament. We were very pleased to see an excellent turnout from members of the public who also participated in a question and answer with members and witnesses on housing issues. Presiding officer, it's clear that the most prominent element of the bill is the proposal that the right to buy social rented houses in Scotland should be abolished. We heard strong evidence from local authorities, housing associations, tenants groups and others that the policy has had its day and that ending the right to buy will, stop, will help stop affordable rented housing being lost from the social housing sector. We heard that it will help RSLs maintain the supply of affordable rented housing stock and make it easier for them to carry out more effective strategic and financial planning. Based on this evidence, the majority of the committee agreed with a proposal to abolish right to buy. I know Alex Johnson will have no problem with me indicating that he was the only committee member who disagreed with this proposal. Having taken the decision that the abolition of right to buy is the correct way to proceed, the majority of the committee also reached the view that the proposed three-year notice period before its implementation is too long. This reflected the strong views heard in evidence that the sooner the abolition comes into effect, the better. We are of the view that a notice period of one year is adequate to allow people who have the right, a right to buy to decide if this option is right for them. I was pleased to hear that the Minister has moved on this point to two years and we look forward to hearing her, her, um, her views on why two years and not one as we pro progress to stage two. As well as proposing the abolition of the right to buy, the bill proposes a range of provisions which will impact on the management of social housing in Scotland. It will help to increase the flexibility that landlords have when allocating houses and give them more tools to tackle antisocial behaviour. The committee is content with these provisions which reflect the broadly positive views we heard in evidence. However, we have highlighted the need for clear guidance on the detail of how certain provisions should work in practice and the factors that will be taken into account in their implementation. Section 5 of the Bill was the subject of concern amongst some of the stakeholders who gave evidence. This repeals provisions which prevent social landlords from taking account of the applicant's age unless properties are specifically designed or adapted for a particular age group. Concerns were expressed that this measure has the potential to be discriminatory towards certain age groups, particularly young people. We were reassured that councils would carry out equality impact assessments when developing their allocation policies and would have to justify their decisions objectively. Nonetheless, the committee calls on the Scottish Government to consider how effective and consistent monitoring might be carried out so that there is no consequential discrimination against any age groups. And I welcome the Minister's comments on this regard. During the Stage 1 scrutiny, local authorities and some tenants groups expressed disappointment that provisions to allow for initial, initial or probationary tenancies were not included in the bill. Others saw that such a proposal was riddled with difficulties. 
However, the committee is of the view that there is no clear indication that would, it would be appropriate to introduce these measures at this time. Moving on to part three, which deals with the private rented sector, the committee agrees with the evidence that supported the bill's transfer of private rented sector cases to the first tier tribunal. Many considered that this would help reduce costs and make the process easier for both tenants and landlords. The committee heard that many also wanted this type of tribunal to be available for social sector rented cases, but it supports the idea that the private rented sector should be prioritised. The committee also supports the Scottish Government's commitment to monitor the progress of the private rented sector tribunal in order to decide whether further changes could be made for the social rented sector cases at a later date. Throughout its evidence taking, the committee sought views on proposals made by the Electrical Safety Council to improve the physical standard of private rented housing. These proposals, which were supported by many other organisations who provided evidence, are that for all private rented accommodation, there should be mandatory five yearly checks of electrical installations and any supplied electrical appliances, mandatory provision of suitable mains powered smoke alarms, and mandatory installation of carbon monoxide alarms. Um, I noted the Minister's comments uh, in her opening remarks, which again uh, will be looked at in stage two. Part four of the bill um, provides for the registration of letting agents, which was widely supported by those who gave evidence. The committee recognises that much of the detail of the register of letting agents and the code of practice is subject to further regulations. However, given the evidence it heard, the committee recommends that the Scottish Government considers how it might include on the face of the bill, as Patrick Harvey said, more detail of what those regulations might cover. This could include professional conduct, qualifications and training and financial obligations. It also recommends that the Scottish Government could, should consider an initial period of registration of one year before an agent progresses to three-year registration as proposed in the bill. Also, the committee heard that it was not clear how many letting agents operate in Scotland and is of the view that the Scottish Government should take an active role in considering how unregistered letting agents might be identified. Part five of the bill deals with mobile homes and the committee welcomes the range of measures proposed in this part of the bill that are designed to help address some of the problems experienced by permanent residents of mobile and park homes. A key proposal is to introduce a fixed site license renewal period and a fee for the administration of the licensing scheme. Evidence suggests that there is a great deal of concern about the potential impact on residents should a site lose its license. Some site owners feel that the fixed three-year renewal period for licenses should be replaced with a more flexible arrangement. The committee recommend recommended an awareness campaign to ensure that both residents and site owners are provided with accurate information about the intentions and potential impacts of the new licensing regime. The committee also recommended an awareness raising exercise amongst local authorities to enhance understanding of mobile and park home site regulations and embed the need for a consistent approach to inspections and enforcement. The committee welcomed the introduction of a fit and proper person test for site owners to help ensure the security of residents. It called on the Scottish Government to consider a feasibility of a shared fit and proper person register to ensure that non-compliant owners can't move between authority areas while continue to continuing to employ non-compliant behaviours on their sites. The committee believed that this would greatly add to the protection of site residents across the country. The committee was concerned that fines to site owners for non-compliance with licensing requirements might, as the bill stands, be passed on to residents, but it's reassured that the um, Scottish Government intends to bring forward an amendment on this at stage two. Part six of the bill seeks to ensure that local authorities have a range of powers to tackle poor conditions in the private sector, and we welcome the principle behind the missing share provision in the bill which will allow local authorities to step in where an owner is unwilling or unable to pay or cannot be found or identified. 
Um, part seven um, deals with uh, proposals, uh, uh, as the Minister said, in relation to the housing regulator, and I'm pleased that the Minister has responded in her opening remarks, and I note her comments. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the uh, Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee welcomes the Housing Scotland Bill as providing a package of measures which will contribute to the improvement of housing in the social, private, rented and owner-occupied sectors, and it rec therefore recommends that the Parliament should agree to the general principles of the Bill. Many, many thanks. I now call on Mary Fee. Ten minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour believes that the Housing Bill, as currently drafted, is a missed opportunity to tackle the housing challenges faced across Scotland. Under the control of this Scottish Government, housing is facing its biggest crisis seen in Scotland since the end of World War II. The Bill contains no new or radical proposals to tackle the problems forced on housing by the SNP. The Bill exposes the lack of vision and leadership under the stewardship of the Housing Minister and our colleagues in the Scottish Cabinet, and the Bill further demonstrates the clear need for a long-term action plan. Instead of proposing a bold vision to build the new houses Scotland urgently needs, we have measures that do not go far enough to merit the praise we will no doubt hear from members on the government benches. What we have here are proposals that tinker around the edges of the serious issues that result in over 155,000 people on waiting lists across Scotland for social housing. I will go into some of the specific aspects of the Bill shortly. However, can I ask the Minister in her closing remarks if she can give us a bit more detail around how the Government intend to properly enforce the registration of letting agents? and explain how the Bill will tackle energy efficiency over and above the announcement made last week, and imp very importantly, explain what steps will be taken to ensure that young people will not be discriminated against if age becomes a factor in allocation. And I was pleased to hear the Minister say uh, in her opening remarks um, on the, the, the right to buy that a two-year period is now being considered. The committee, as Maureen Mott in her remarks stated, recommended that it was reduced to one year, and I would be grateful if, in her closing remarks, the Minister could give us a bit more detail about why she's moved to two years and hasn't adopted the committee's recommended one year. And, Presiding Officer, Part 1 of the Bill rightly abolishes the right to buy, and the vast majority of respondents to the Scottish Government consultation support this proposal, as do Scottish Labour. Councillor Harry McGuigan of COSLA is right when he says that the abolition of the right to buy is absolutely necessary if we are able to meet the requirements and demand of housing in our communities. However, we would all be foolish to believe that the abolition will somehow create more houses in itself, but it does give councils and housing associations the ability to improve strategic and business planning as well as keep good quality housing in the public sector. It is worth noting that almost half a million homes in Scotland were sold under the right to buy, and regretfully almost a third are now in the private rented sector, with rents almost double those that remain socially rented. And on the timescale for the abolition, we, as I said earlier, we strongly favour less than the three years, and again I would be grateful if the Minister could explain further why she is moving to two. Presiding Officer, Part 2 of the Bill attempts to address some of the social problems associated with social housing supply, but again is a missed opportunity to tackle the problems head on. Shelter Scotland and Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People warned in committee that there could be disadvantaged groups if age is taken into consideration. As the Minister knows, Shelter has set up an online petition and I am sure her inbox will be filling up with young people signing up. <clears throat> and it would have been more beneficial for the Minister had this proposal been in the original consultation. Hence the anger from the Scotland, Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People, Shelter and other organisations that work with young people. And I do know that some councils currently use age as a criteria in allocating housing. It is only half a mile from where I live. Flats had been prioritised for elderly tenants, and this is having a positive effect in the area. And whilst recognising that this provision could have benefits, we want to ensure that Section 5 
does not have serious implications in regard to equality legislation, but also for the housing needs of young people who could be denied a quality home and the government must provide solid and watertight guidance for local authorities and registered social landlords in the event they use such powers. If the proposal, if proposals remain as they are, we would like to see a code of practice implemented as well as effective monitoring to ensure discrimination is not taking place. The antisocial behaviour elements of the bill must also be backed by checks and balances so that the provisions are not misused. During the evidence sessions, we heard that there is a need for the government to clarify what evidence can be used, how it can be trusted, and how issues can be remedied. We want to ensure that any measures are used in an effective manner that ends the misery that many communi communities endure. At the same time as working with those responsible to change their behaviour. Gary Burns and Paul Brown expressed frustrations on the types of evidence that can be used and the historical period when incidents were committed in relation to triple STs. And I know from my time as a councillor, as well others in the chamber, resolving issues in the first place is far more beneficial and more cost effective if that works for both parties. There is a hard working assist team in Renfrewshire and mitigation should always be the first option. Reasonable preference must be used to house those in dire need and the current preference groups are outdated and must be brought in line with current practice. But further clarification on unmet housing need is required and with an ageing population there will be a number of elderly people living in homes that are not suitably adapted and it is only right that preference is given to our elderly to improve their health, well-being and mobility. And on the qualifying period in secession for carers, we do not want to see unpaid carers left homeless in the event they do not meet the new qualifying period. This could be at great cost to them emotionally and to the social landlord in rehousing them. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government have to be careful here when legislating on the proposals for social housing in the bill and then passing on the responsibility for carrying out such proposals to local authorities that could lead to legal challenges, as warned in the committee. And Margaret Burgess and the government must take responsibility for this. And moving on to part three of the bill, Scottish Labour supports the transfer to first tier tribunals. We know what's happening in sheriff courts across the country. And to improve both criminal justice and housing related action, we need to reduce the burden on local sheriff courts. And representation in tribunals is an issue that does need further clarification. And I know from my own time sitting on tribunal panels that they are more plain spoken than courts and much less imposing. But where a tenant needs advocacy, this must be guaranteed. And we also support the committee's recommendations on electrical safety, smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms and look to the government to make these amendments at stage two. And presiding officer, the registration of letting agents is to be supported, but we want to make sure that there is a process in place for identifying unregistered agents. This step is one in a number of steps put in place by the government over recent years, and we want to make sure that all tenants and possible tenants are not ripped off, but those letting agents that have been lacking in ethics may still continue to operate under the radar, and it's a must that these agents are regulated. We also need to know what sanctions will be available for anyone found working outside of registration. And if the government is to place responsibility on councils with regulation, local authorities must not be burdened with the costs associated. And licensing of mobile home sites with permanent residents in part five of the bill clearly have some issues that need to be addressed at stage two. The committee has called on the government to clarify some of these issues, such as the fixed term for a license and the adverse effect on funding, the use of renewal instead of review, and fines for non-compliance being passed on to the residents. And, presiding officer, we know the housing conditions in the private rented sector are far short of what we would call acceptable. And the measures in part six of the bill do not go far enough in tackling poor conditions. Proposals for energy efficiency in private rented homes appears to have been overlooked, and we want to see this issue raised at stage two. And in part seven of the bill, 
there are questions to be asked of the government on how it intends to consult with sector stakeholders <coughs> excuse me, in regards to the proposals for the Scottish Housing Regulator to transfer RSL assets in the event of insolvency. And in closing, presiding officer, we do have some real concerns that the passage of the bill will not solve any of the problems that have resulted in the current housing crisis. With fewer houses being built in Scotland than at any time since the end of World War II, we need a bold and ambitious statement of intent from the Scottish Government. And this bill falls far from that standard. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Alex Johnston. Six minutes or thereby, please, Mr. Thank Johnston. you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I rise to speak on the Housing Scotland Bill on what I believe will be go down in history as a dark, dark day for liberty and democracy in Scotland. However, before I get on to my main subject, I wanted to run through the bill uh, in fairly short order. There's a great deal in this bill that is actually very desirable uh, and which will find my support, although I may move to amend some of the characteristics within it. On social housing, the proposal to look at using age criteria and the allocation policy, I believe is an important change uh, and one which I will support. In fact, I've already discussed with the Minister how such a change might be used to develop uh, other strategies in future, uh, particularly in relation to veterans, and she's given me assurances that that will be considered, although not within the framework of this bill. However, my concern over the change to using age as a, a criteria and allocation policy is one which I do support, and I'm disappointed that Shelter and one or two other organisations have sought to put an interpretation on that which doesn't conform with my reading of the bill. Uh, and the strong defence of the policy published today by the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, I think, is one that we should uh, take very seriously. I'm also concerned that in that section there's no uh, proposal for probationary tenancies. The fact that this was consulted on and found a great deal of support among landlords uh, is one which I think we should have taken more seriously and as a consequence I may seek to amend the bill at stage two. In relation to private let rented housing, the proposal for moving uh, the, from the Sheriff Court to first-tier tribunals to deal with disputes is one which received a great deal of support. In fact, the suggestion that social rent, the social rented sector should be treated the same way uh, was enthusiastically received. And it's my understanding that uh, once this proposal is in place, that the government will consider whether it can be extended at a later date. But on the whole issue of landlord registration and the registration of letting agents, I think the approach taken by the government is to be commended. The work that's been done between these organisations and the government has meant that there is genuine support within the industry for the regulatory framework which is being proposed. And that ultimately is what will make it a success if those who are being governed choose to be governed uh, in this way and regulated in this way, then we will have positive outcomes. I also, of course, welcome the provisions in stage six, uh, part six of the bill, which will allow us to tackle poor conditions. But from that, I must go to the subject of right to buy. Right to buy was a transformational policy. It had the effect of creating stable, mixed tenure communities which contributed to strong, stable societies in many parts of Scotland. The opportunity taken by many to become homeowners is something which has changed lives and will continue to change lives in the future. The suggestion has been made on many occasions that we should not be selling these houses because they're required in the social rented sector. Yet, if you look at the facts, there are some very big holes in that argument. To qualify for right to buy, you have to be a long-term tenant. And those who are denied the right to buy will most likely remain tenants. The fact is that those people, those houses that are not to be available to buy in future, uh, if, they were, if they were unlikely to come back onto the market to be relet as social housing, and perhaps two or three percent at the most would have returned to the market in year one. The fact is that it will not have the effect of increasing the number of houses available. The Minister has spoken today about the timescale that will be given for taking away that right to buy. 
She has decided that she will propose a two-year timescale rather than three years, which was contained in the original draft of the Bill. I want to ensure that everyone who wishes to buy their home will get that opportunity. However, at this stage, I would not suggest that two years is any less of an opportunity than three. I am concerned that those who are currently in protected areas will not have the opportunity to buy their homes. And with that, I am concerned to ensure that the rights that are being protected for those who are not in protected areas have some uh, kind of quid pro quo within the protected areas themselves. And I will be consulting uh, and taking legal advice on whether that uh, is properly covered by the bill. Ultimately, the problem we face is that this bill in itself creates a problem that did not exist in advance of the bill. It seems that in recent years, the latest yearly figures we have suggest that only 1,500 houses were bought by their tenants. Right to buy, in effect, was withering on the vine. By moving to end right to buy, the government have opened a window of opportunity for hundreds of thousands of Scots who still have that right. The likely outcome of this legislation is that there will be a peak in demand for right to buy over the next two years. The result of that will be that many houses that may have remained uh, in the social rented sector will now be removed as part of this process. I see the abolition of right to buy as a vindictive and politically motivated move that will, at the end of the day, simply be counterproductive. Thank you, Mr Johnson. We now move to the open debate. Speeches are six minutes. Can I remind members we are very, very tight for time. Gordon MacDonald, followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Edinburgh has the largest private rented sector in Scotland with 51,000 registered homes, which is just less than a quarter of the housing stock and is expected to rise to over 30% by 2018, compared to only 12% across Scotland. As a result of such a large private rented sector in Edinburgh, many of my constituents find that the only way they can put a roof over their heads is taking up a tenancy either through a private landlord or a letting agency. So what will the housing bill offer the many families that have a private sector tenancy? There are three parts of the bill that will be of interest to my constituents. Part three creates a tribunal to deal with disputes. Part four regulates letting agents and part six tackles private housing conditions. The creation of a new housing tribunal for the private rented sector has been welcomed by the Chartered Institute of Housing, who stated it was a new specialist and more modern approach to dispute resolution, and that neither tenants nor landlords in the private rented sector see the current share of court system as user-friendly or efficient. The Law Society of Scotland has also approved of the transfer of the Sheriff's jurisdiction to the First Tier Tribunal. This change will result in 700 cases per year being removed from the Sheriff Court system. The aim of Part 3 of the Bill is to provide better access to justice for tenants and landlords where disputes arise. However, as Inclusion Scotland highlighted, some private tenants may be reluctant to take issues to the Tribunal because of fear of reprisals by landlords, that there will need to be exemptions to any Tribunal fees for those who cannot afford to pay, and that certain people with protected characteristics, including disabled people, may need support to participate effectively in proceedings. Part 3 of the Bill will also allow local authorities to report a landlord to the private rented housing panel for failing to comply with the repairing standard that landlords are required to meet in order to rent out their property. Previously, only tenants could refer a landlord to the panel something many were reluctant to do for fear of losing their tenancy. Part four of the bill may go some way to alleviate some of Inclusion Scotland's concerns regarding landlords. This part of the bill will establish a mandatory register of letting agents, with those applying to be on the register required to meet a fit and proper person test. This test already exists within the landlord registration scheme and aims to weed out anyone who has committed any offence involving fraud, dishonesty, violence, drugs, discrimination, firearms or sexual offences 
as well as failing to comply with housing legislation. This section will also create a statutory code of practice and a dispute resolution procedure for letting agents and tenants. The committee recommends that the Scottish Government considers how it might include details on the face of the bill relating to professional conduct, qualifications needed to be a letting agent, training for staff and how their financial obligations should be handled. Part 6 of the bill ensures that local authorities have a range of powers to tackle poor conditions in the private sector. The last Scottish House Conditions Survey that looked at this issue in detail estimated that there were £223 million worth of essential improvements outstanding in the private rented sector across Scotland. The bill provides a discretionary power to local authorities in order to carry out support in order to support owners of communal blocks to carry out repairs by allowing the council to pay the missing share and recovering the outstanding sum later from the owner who is either unable or unwilling to pay. How effective this will be will depend on individual local authorities' view on their available funding, the difficulty in recovering outstanding monies and the timescale for that recovery. In Edinburgh, the Council is owed £22 million by up to 3,500 property owners for work carried out to their homes under the statutory notice system that previously existed. Now, people need time to, repair, to, to repay repair costs. However, the suggested 30-year repayment period, in my view, is excessive and will mean that local authorities may consider not to make use of this discretionary power. This will not help the many families and individuals who live in poor housing conditions. Therefore, I hope the Minister will consider the Committee's recommendation that local authorities should be given flexibility to determine the time period over which the share must be paid back based on individual circumstances. This change, if accepted, will, it, will hopefully encourage local authorities to make use of this power to assist private rented sector tenants to have their homes improved. Finally, Presiding Officer, with regard to the ending of the right to buy, this was supported by 83% of all respondents uh, to the consultation, including 81% of councils, 92% of registered social landlords, 73% of individuals, and 75% of tenants groups. Today's newspaper carries a headline, Scots Tories warn of rush if right to buy ends. Well, if if this could be the outcome, then we should ensure that the lead-in period is reduced further from the two years announced by the Minister to at least one year in order to protect what is left of our social housing. I now call Mark Griffin, followed by John Mason. Thank you, President Officer. In the housing bill we have in front of us, there, there isn't a lot to disagree with. It's an extensive bill and there are a number of areas in the bill where there is broad agreement and the proposals represent a step forward. Similarly, there are areas we feel could be strengthened um, to give more protection to tenants and communities. And there are areas um, where we feel that this bill represents a, a missed opportunity. Can Certainly. Mason. Yes, yes, the member repeats what his front bench uh, colleague said about a missed opportunity, but she didn't tell us what any of the missed opportunities were other than more money. D does he have any examples? Mark Griffin. Certainly, I, mean, I, I set out three areas where I think the bill is good, where it can be approved and where it's a missed opportunity, and I'll come on to define those three areas. Um, by giving local authorities the power to enforce repairs uh, and maintenance in the private sector, uh, the government has taken away the opportunity for a landlord to issue a notice to quit or harass a tenant who simply exercises their right to live in an adequately maintained home. And that's not to say that um, every or, or even many landlords would behave in that way, but there certainly is a fear amongst tenants and communities of, of rocking the boat and suffering at the hands of an angry landlord giving social landlords more flexibility to allocate houses in a more sensible way using local knowledge can create more sustainable communities, but this should be accompanied by clear guidance so that young people in particular are not discriminated against when it comes to allocating individual properties. The transfer of jurisdiction, jurisdiction from 
civil cases relating to the private sector from the Sheriff Court to the First Tier Tribunal should reduce the costs and the timescale for disputes to be resolved and also for highly skilled members of the Tribunal to build up the experience required to deal with those matters. And it will be interesting to see how that progresses and if it is um, as was suggested during evidence sessions that that would be rolled out to the social sector. Those are, are examples where the bill is strong um, on improving tenants' rights and creating stronger communities. Um, but there are also weaknesses, uh, which I hope the government will address at stage two. This government has taken steps to mitigate the impact of right to buy with the introduction of pressured area status and now through the outright abolition of right to buy. I think that's long overdue and should have been done a long time ago under previous administrations as well. Sorry, I, sorry Mr Crawford, I know we're tight for time and I, I need to make progress. Now, witness after witness told of the impact on social landlords and their ability to budget, access capital from financial institutions and plan any improvement programmes um, or new house build programmes. And that goes some way to explaining why so few uh, local authority houses have built, been built over the past um, years. Now, what I don't understand, though, is the inclusion of a three-year window to allow even more social housing stock to be lost to the private sector. Um, that's been now changed to two years, but the argument was made by the bill team that the three-year timescale was felt to be fair and reasonable due to potential issues with the European Convention on Human Rights. The Scottish Government's Brief, briefly. Mr Crawford, Mr Giffen, please tell me where in the 2011 Labour manifesto that you suggested that this right to buy should be removed. Matt Griffin. I've long been a, a supporter of the removal of, of right to buy. I think the government has taken the right step. And I myself have said it should have been done a, a long time ago. I, I would think that Mr Crawford would welcome the consensus on most of the chamber on the removal of right to buy. And I'll move on to to say why I think that that, should be, um, that time scale should be reduced even further. I think if we all agree, or most of us agree, that right to buy should go because of the impact it's had on social housing stock and the ability of landlords to improve or increase the housing stock, then the government should be working towards what they feel is the minimum time period um, that right to, be, right to buy could be abolished. If, if we agree with it, um, we should take an evidence-based approach to look at the shortest time possible to abolish it and, and just get on with that. Another area which I think the government could strengthen is uh, at stage two is on antisocial behaviour. I might be wrong, but I think the introduction of this bill is the first time a government minister has mentioned antisocial behaviour in this session. It, it's a massive issue which hasn't gone away. The government need to set out how they feel that short SSTs will add to the ability of local authorities in dealing with antisocial behaviour, as opposed to simply moving the problem around different communities. And finally, um, the areas that I don't think have been covered um, adequately is that... During your last 30 seconds, Mr Griffin. Certainly. Members of our communities will think that when the Housing Scotland Bill is debated in Parliament that they would expect to see in that bill a, a recognition in that house, level, uh, house building levels are at their, their lowest for decades and a plan on how to in increase house building and, and make up that shortfall of 160,000 homes. The other issue that was pointed up earlier by my colleague is the massive disparity in the exact same homes which were previously local authority stock and the rent that is charged to the private tenants as opposed to the tenants who are in the existing local stock. And I will close there um, as I see the presiding officer. Thank you, I Mr Griffin. You were getting the evil eye, but you recognised it. John Mason, followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Hey, thank you, uh, presiding officer. I, mean, I think just to follow on that particular point, I would not expect in the housing bill an allocation of the budget for more housing. Uh, I think it is agreed amongst certainly the two main parties in this chamber that we would like to spend money on more housing. That needs to come under the budget, not under this housing bill. Uh, presiding officer, if I could make some general comments about housing associations and RSLs in my constituency especially, and why I am enthusiastic about them. 
It is hard to get a balance between professionalism and local control. I think that's easier in better off areas like the West End of Glasgow, easier to get local folk who have professional experience and qualifications, whether it be to sign a passport form or help complete a lottery application. In poorer areas, we can have big national and very good organisations like Quarriers, but they're not really locally controlled. Or we can have very small organisations run entirely by volunteers, which can struggle to obtain the expertise they need. And that is why I consider housing associations fill such a key role in the fabric of a constituency like mine in the East End of Glasgow. Housing associations have a combination of local control and professionalism, which is very seldom matched in other organisations in my area. And that is why I'm so enthusiastic about them, and I'm very concerned about their merging or joining groups, as I was concerned about GHA not being broken up more. Secondly, clearly there are many things in the bill that are widely welcomed, uh, for example, the abolition of right to buy, and I very much welcome uh, the fact the Minister has announced uh, a reduction in the length of time till that happens. On the private rented sector, I very much welcome the registering of letting agents. I myself get frequent complaints from tenants especially, but also landlords and neighbours about letting agents, uh, often regarding the state of a property or antisocial behaviour, and it has been very difficult in the past to find a way forward. However, I also agree there's no point having registration without teeth, as seems to have happened with landlord registration. So I would welcome committee recommendations in paragraph 180, for example, as to what regulations might cover. There is very rigorous oversight of the social rented sector and much less of the private rented sector, yet they have very similar tenants in my experience. The SFHA take up that point uh, in one of their briefing notes to the committee, I think, uh, page 2, paragraph 2.3, uh, which says, however, we note there is nothing in this bill that will bring the private rented sector anywhere near the levels of the social rented sector in terms of the regulation of management or of physical property standards. Uh, but I would accept that we are moving uh, in the right direction. One specific area where we need to see improvements in the private rented sector concerns electrical safety. I personally was taken aback when I first heard that a majority of accidental fires are caused by electricity. I think I had assumed, as maybe others did, that it would inevitably be gas. So I'm very happy to endorse the committee's recommendation at paragraph eh, 168, and the Minister has given positive words eh, about that as well. I have heard the suggestion made that increased security of private tenancy could lead to a tenant investing more in their property for the longer term and hopefully being part, more part of the community than has been the case often in the past. And I think that is another area worth exploring. Finally, in the private rented sector, I would just like to throw in my continuing concern about the Belgrove Hotel in my own constituency. It does not fall neatly into any of the categories we are discussing today. And as a result, some 140 vulnerable tenants do not get the protection of being in the social rented sector, nor the protection we hope to give to private tenants in the future. I'm not expecting an answer on this today, but the Minister knows it concerns me and I believe it concerns her as well. Returning to some specifics in the social rented housing, I mentioned group structures before and it does seem at times that smaller associations are being gobbled up, either by way of merger or acquisition. Should tenants always get to vote on such a merger or acquisition if they're joining a group? I think there is a danger of losing local understanding and accountability and I'm glad that the government is positive about this and is consulting on it. Concerning the Scottish Housing Regulator, I'm not sure how much can be changed by legislation, but I'm concerned at some of the things I'm hearing about the relationship between the regulator and associations. It's important to get a balance between distance and yet have still having a relationship. I think sometimes that relationship was too close in the past, but I do wonder if it is now too distant and we could do with an improved attitude and a better working together. Uh, SFHA again uh, refer to this in uh, their briefing for today, um, for example, asking for establishing a requirement for the Scottish Housing Regulator to publish, following consultation, a consolidated code of regulatory practice that addresses all of its methods for intervening in the affairs of social landlords, including those that are not publicly reported and those that do not involve the use of statutory intervention powers. Specifically, too, I wonder if the regulator is too keen on larger groups of associations with the consequential loss of local involvement that inevitably follows. 
On allocation policies, I wonder how far we can go with the strengthening local connection being taken into account. We are, dealing, last 30 seconds. we are dealing with some complex family structures these days, and I frequently get cases where school, work, childcare and access are all being juggled with difficulty, and the request is for rehousing in the immediate local area. In some cases, that may not ever be possible because larger homes are not available, but swinging the policies towards that direction where community involvement is available, eh, I think would be very valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Welcome to some followed by Jimmy D. Officer, like several uh, previous speakers, I find most of what's in the bill is acceptable and the real issue is what is missing uh, from it. Clearly, the headlines are going to be captured by clauses uh, one and two on the abolition of the right to buy, and I don't uh, object uh, to that. But I think there is a danger uh, of overstating its effects, and of course there is also a danger, if it's not done quickly, that it may have unintended uh, consequences. I think the, the, it's a mistake to believe that it is going to be a panacea for the chronic shortage of affordable uh, uh, rented housing, social rented housing uh, in this country. And that is the danger to which I referred. Clearly, there have been many outstanding affordable housing developments in recent times. And I'm pleased if I can put a plug in to be officially opening one in Leith tomorrow, which has actually been named uh, by uh, the Chartered Institute of Housing at uh, UK level as one of the best affordable housing developments uh, in the UK. But the fact of the matter is that it's increasingly difficult for housing associations to build socially rented houses in the numbers that are required because of the reductions in the HAG levels. And any housing association will tell you that. The reinstatement of the HAG, to some extent, was welcome, but it hasn't gone nearly far enough. So we will see a declining number of social rented houses, and that's the problem that confronts the Minister. And obviously, she always makes comparisons with previous administrations in terms of affordable housing uh, more generally. There are three other points in the bill about social rented housing. First, on allocations, I note that the Chartered Institute of Housing said that the new criteria wouldn't really make much difference at all. But the under-occupancy criteria is, is welcome, although I do worry myself about those who are over-occupied uh, in social rented housing because they seem to have very little opportunity to move, certainly in Edinburgh. Antisocial behaviour is a massive problem, as we all know from our constituency um, surgeries and, and, and uh, uh, emails and so on. And many witnesses said that what was proposed in the bill wouldn't really have a significant effect on that, although we have to hope that the uh, increasing opportunities for using the short SST uh, will be helpful in that regard, because uh, nobody wants to evict anybody, but I think in certain circumstances, uh, eviction has to be uh, an option, and presumably it will be uh, easier uh, for a short SST than for the, the standard SST. The age issue, obviously, was the most controversial, and like um, um, uh, Mary Fee and, uh, 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 and others, I think the important thing here is to have a code of practice and effective monitoring, because clearly there are worries with sh from Shelter and the Children's Commissioner that we have to take uh, seriously, and in particular, I think we should track um, the percentage of young people who are getting uh, tenancies, although, of course, that has increased considerably since the 2012 homelessness uh, legislation kicked, kicked in. I mean, Mary Fee did say it could be positive, and she instanced the flats prioritised for elderly people uh, somewhere uh, in her area. I think the problem is we did have a block of flats in Leith that was successful with older people, and in fact, the percentage of the uh, tenancies going to uh, homeless people was the same as previously, but the regulator said they had to stop it. So I think there probably does need to be a change in the law if uh, we want that to be an option. Anyway, I think the biggest miss missed opportunities are in the, in the private rented sector. Obviously, I welcome the tribunal and the letting agents, although, again, uh, the points about enforcement and identification made by James Kelly and Mary Fee are important. But when it comes, for example, to landlord registration, we have just a minor change in Clause 22, but the problem is uh, landlord registration has become a largely bureaucratic exercise, but action on antisocial behaviour of private tenants and on the failure of uh, landlords to take their responsibility for common repairs could to some extent be dealt with, I believe, through uh, a beefed up landlord registration system. Anyway, moving on to other issues with the private sector, all of them to do with amendments to the 2006 Act. I note the repairing standard was created by that Act and the private uh, rented housing 
Pana was created by that Act. So it's good that we're going to have an amendment about electrical safety checks beefing up the repairing standard. Uh, but I note that the City of Edinburgh Council ha has suggested that it's not just local authorities that should be able to make a report uh, on the repairing standard, but also neighbours affected by privately rented property and, crucially, neighbouring homeowners when a landlord is not contributing to common repairs. So that's a massive problem in my constituency, parts of it anyway, landlords not contributing to common repairs. So that's, I think, an interesting suggestion from the City of Edinburgh Council. And they have other interesting and important suggestions when it comes to um, uh, common repairs more generally. There are minor changes in clauses 73 and 74 to work notices and maintenance uh, orders, but the City of Edinburgh Council propose that uh, all owners should be required to develop, um, all owners who've got uh, common parts to their property, that is, should be required to develop a plan to ensure maintenance of the common parts. An annual roof inspection should be included in that, a payment plan and the appointment of a responsible person or agent to manage the plan. So I think that suggestion from the City of Edinburgh Council uh, should be considered uh, for uh, future amendments. And finally, of course, there is the issue of widening the scope of where a missing share can be paid. It's already possible under Section 50 of the 2006 Act in certain circumstances. But again, Edinburgh is suggesting around that more flexibility so it's not a 30-year uh, repayment period. They're suggesting charter orders should be secured uh, um, by, by, by priority, priority ranking. Course. And finally, they're suggesting a fund that local authorities can access to facilitate shared repairs. There are major issues in Edinburgh about this. I hope the proposals from the City of Edinburgh Council will be seriously considered by the Government. Thank you, Mr Chisholm. Jim Eadie, followed by Jim Hume. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the provision of good quality affordable housing is what we would all want to see for ourselves, for our families and for our communities. And while legislation alone cannot deliver that, I do believe that this bill, together with the unprecedented levels of investment, will take us closer to achieving that ambition for all of our citizens. The centrepiece of the legislation is, of course, the abolition of the right to buy, which will retain thousands of homes in the social rented sector over the coming decade. And the right to buy legislation introduced by a Conservative government in the early 1980s was controversial. I remember at the time it being opposed by a dynamic and forward-thinking director of Shelter Scotland by the name of Margot Macdonald. It is fitting, therefore, that we should recall that in the week in which tributes have been paid in this chamber to Margot's massive contribution to Scottish public life. There has been near unanimity within the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee on this issue, although we should recognise the lone dissenting voice of Alec Johnson, who sought to keep the spirit of Margaret Thatcher and the concept of a property-owning democracy alive throughout our deliberations. But, of course, it was the reality in terms of the weight and body of evidence we received from across civil society which was overwhelming in its opposition to the right to buy. The situation was summed up best in the evidence session in Dumbarton by Jennifer McLeod of the Highland and Argyll and Butte Tenants Network, who quite rightly contrasted the right to buy with the right to rent. She stated, reflecting on her own experience in her own community, and I quote, I could see the reduction in the number of houses that were available for rent. We have a right to rent as well as a right to buy. Over the years, the right to buy has done great damage to the amount of housing stock that is available, and I am glad that it is finishing. Of course, I have another reason to be grateful to Jennifer McLeod, asked by me later on in the evidence session if she would like to contribute her views on the issue of secure tenancies. She replied in a wonderful Highland accent, No, I just happen to be looking at you, gazing in wonder. I replied that I did not know whether to be flattered or concerned by that statement. A further insight into the right to buy comes from Charles Moore in his authorised biography of Margaret Thatcher, in which he states, and I quote, the policy had its disadvantages. The most notable were the gradual build-up of a housing shortage, which in 1979 had not existed, and the stoking for the future of a housing bubble. While the impact of the housing bubble was not felt in Scotland to the degree, to the degree that it was south of the border, his comment nonetheless is a sobering antidote to the rose-tinted memories of Alec Johnson and others on the Conservative benches. Many people did take advantage of the opportunity to buy their council house, often at a significant discount, but that was at the expense of the diminution of the council housing stock, reducing the number of good quality homes for families who could not afford to buy and who found themselves stuck in the less desirable properties. This bill addresses that inequity. I believe there are a number of ways in which the bill can be further strengthened. 
giving households with pregnant women and children the right to challenge being placed in homeless temporary accommodation, which is of a very poor standard. I intend to bring forward an amendment at stage two with the support of Shelter Scotland to address that issue so that households with children or expectant mothers can have the legislative right to challenge the local authority that places them in poor quality accommodation. Another issue which has been referred to is that of introducing carbon monoxide safety requirements for properties in the private rented sector. I am grateful to Shelter Scotland for their support on this issue and I will be bringing forward an amendment at stage two. They have rightly said that they wish to see carbon monoxide alarms being mandat become mandatory in all privately rented properties in Scotland. And I want to see further progress on that and to work with other members across the chamber to achieve that, that further change to the bill. Shelter have also highlighted the issue, and it's been referred to uh, previously, um, of the possible age discrimination against future tenants um, who come within um, the ambit of the legislation. Now, I welcome the Minister's clear commitment this afternoon to further reflect on the range of views uh, that have been uh, uh, submitted uh, in the course of the Bill's uh, passage uh, through the different parliamentary stages. But I would only um, draw attention to the fact that the committee received a range of evidence on this issue and there was a clear division between the local authorities and registered social landlords and Shelter Scotland, the Children and Young People's Commissioner and other organisations acting on behalf of homeless people. Clearly there needs to be much further exploration and discussion uh, on these issues before any final conclusions can be reached. I have also, like Malcolm Chisholm, received representations from the City of Edinburgh Council and I would encourage Scottish Government Ministers and officials to engage in a constructive dialogue uh, with the Council to address those issues. Extending the power to make third party referrals to the private rented housing panel, the enforcement of landlord contributions to common repairs, increasing the flexibility for local authorities to determine the length of a repayment period, as Malcolm Chisholm uh, said, when covering a missing share, and also, as Malcolm Chisholm um, referred to, the requirement for owners to produce a maintenance plan covering common repairs. All of these, I think, are reasonable observations and suggestions for further progress and work to be done. In conclusion, this bill has much to commend it, but there are further steps which can be taken to further strengthen the legislation, and I look forward to playing my part with colleagues across the Chamber at Stage 2 to bring about these improvements. Thank you, Mr Edie. Jim Hume, followed by Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this afternoon's very important debate. I broadly welcome many of the aims contained within the Scottish Government's housing bill, and it's hard to argue that some of them are, are not long overdue. For example, the scrapping of right to buy and the long-awaited regulation of letting agents will undoubted, undoubtedly arrest the decline of social housing stock and provide some long-awaited protection for tenants by driving up professionalism amongst the letting agents. I also welcome the introduction of a tribunal service to better serve tenants and letting agents in dispute and take away some, some of the pressures felt by our sheriff courts. But I do have some concerns over the need of a tenant to pay a fee to progress their complaint to a tribunal. Uh, many tenants who find themselves in dispute with letting agents are vulnerable with little money who I fear may be priced out of seeking justice. So I'd like the Minister perhaps in summing up to provide assurances that no one will be priced out of access, accessing the tr tribunal system as there must be access of course for all. We are currently in the midst of a housing crisis in this country with 180,000 people on local authority waiting lists a third of whom have been on those lists for over three years. In that regard, you can understand the desire of the Minister to increase flexibility in the management and allocation of social housing. The Government's news release described this as allowing landlords to make better use of their stock, tackle antisocial behaviour and provide further protection for tenants. That's all good. What they were noticeably quite wrong, though, was the details. Details which included provisions in Section 5 of the Bill to remove the prohibition on taking age into account in social housing allocations. I know that's a measure that the Chartered Institute of Housing Scotland called for and has the support of the SH, SFHA. I realise the Minister is going to look at that again, it's, but it's also a measure that did not originally feature in the consultation. The arguments in favour speak of removing barriers and helping social landlords to make sensible allocations to sustain tenancies and communities. To my mind, the reality on the ground will wind up being quite different. I share the concerns of Citizens Advice Scotland, 
who stated that the removal of this protection could result in particular age groups, but in all likelihood the young, being allocated to undesirable areas. In this matter, I also uh, associate myself with shelter and indeed congratulate them for taking the lead in opposing the removal of this prohibition. But the Minister will know that shelter is not alone. Last month, she did receive a letter from Graham Brown and 11 other representatives from organisations such as Children in Scotland, Bernardo's, Homeless Action Scotland and the Poverty Alliance detailing that opposition. And I agree with their assessment that current legislation and practice already allow for social landlords to respond to particular requirements over, for example, accessibility or the need for an adapted property. The letter also addressed those who say that this proposal will enable social landlords to tackle imbalances in communities by correcting, correctly highlighting that they are already able to do so through a local, local lettings initiative and, of course, sensitive lets. The allocation of social housing must also uh, be done on the basis of need and, I believe, nothing else. This proposal has a real danger to lead to age discrimination, primarily against young people, so often a section of society in the most pressing need of housing. Regardless of the protections affording in the, in the Equality Act, I do hope the Minister will seek to remove this proposal from the Bill uh, quite soon. While I have issue with some things in the bill, I also think there are a few small missed opportunities. One thing I would like to see improved, and I intend to introduce an amendment to the bill at stage two to this effect, is through the use of section five referrals. This is a process whereby when a local authority seeks a registered social landlord's assistance in housing a homeless person, if it's done through a Section 5 referral, that homeless person will enjoy certain safeguards, such as a response from the RSL within a reasonable period, and that a request will not be, be declined without a good reason. However, not all councils currently use Section 5 referrals when engaging with social landlords to house a homeless person, uh, denying such the, uh, thereby denying such people the safeguards afforded through the robust and consistent framework Section 5 of the 2001 Act provides. So I would like to see all referrals done through Section 5 and urge the Minister to commit today to amending the Bill to do so. If she doesn't, then as I said, I am prepared to table amendments at Stage 2. This is an important Bill, but it has by no means a perfect set of proposals, and there are some in particular which do not just need amended or refined, but they need dropped altogether. I will be supporting the bill at stage one in, recogni in recognition of the undoubted benefits it will deliver in certain areas, but as I said, we'll be looking for some significant work to have been done by the bill at stage two. Thank you, Mr. Hume. Bob Doris, followed by John Lamont. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by looking at electrical safety, as we've heard from other members earlier. Uh, and in relation to the private rented sector. Firstly, let me pay tribute to our Housing Minister and the constructive approach that she's taken with the Electrical Safety Council, although I should now call them Electrical Safety First. They have changed their name, they have rebranded themselves, but also with myself and her willingness to consider legislation in this area within the Bill. Uh, the Electrical Safety Council provided strong evidence that, uh, and I'll read from their submission, that 69% of all accidental fires in Scottish homes, more than 3,400 annually, are caused by ele electricity. Independent research, they propose, also suggests that private tenants are more likely to be at risk of electric shock or fire than owner-occupiers. So there is a, an evidence base in relation to the extent of the problem. That's why that I have supported for some time now calls for five yearly checks on both fixed wiring and portable electrical equipment. I am pleased, therefore, that the Minister is indicating that she is supportive of a Stage 2 amendment, and I do fully appreciate that details of that amendment has to be seen first by government before they confirm fully that they can accept it. But I can confirm that I hope to lodge that amendment at Stage 2, and that will require five yearly cycle for periodic inspection reports on fixed wiring and five yearly portable appliance testing. Um, but I should say it's not just the Electrical Safety Council that's been calling for that because they've been excellent in building a coalition of various partners. And I'll just um, read some of the 12 trade associations that 
also back this call. Scottish Association of Landlords, Shelter Scotland, uh, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors and the Chartered Institute of Housing Scotland. So a broad coalition and alliance around that. So I hope we can have success at stage two in bringing that forward. But I want to say a little bit more about the Scottish Association of Landlords because I do a lot of work with them as well, and, and too often we talk about the cowboy landlords in the private rented sector, and the Scottish Association of Landlords are the top performers. They are the registered landlords that are seeking to do all they can. I suspect Alex Johnson may be a registered uh, landlord also. Who knows? Uh, we can check his declaration of interest. But they drew to my attention, they re-familiarised me with uh, the repairing standards in the Scout Housing Scotland 2006 Act says, regard is to be had to any guidance set out by ministers in relation to section 131F. And I know you all know what section 131F is, but I'll just remind you what that actually says. That is that the House has satisfactory provision for detecting fires and for giving warning in the evidence of fire or suspected fire. Such guidance, I understand, is in the technical handbook in relation to that and 2013 guidance requires, if you're still following me, presiding officer, 2013 guidance requires hardwired smoke detectors in all public rooms. Now, which uh, tenures does this cover? Well, it covers new build properties, it covers redeveloped properties and it covers private rented properties. It doesn't cover social rented properties, so the standards in terms of fire safety and social rented properties are lower than private rented properties, and I think that's a reasonable thing to put on the record. So we should give some cognizance in considering to the, the various standards between different tenures, and I think that's an important thing to do. I think we should also give regard to the expression that uh, in the 2006 Act that uh, private landlords should give regard to. There's a vagueness in that expression for what giving regard to actually means. Does it mean they should do it, they shouldn't do it, they should think about it and maybe do it? There is, there's a vagueness there that perhaps we have to look at and address. And uh, the private landlords I speak to, including the Scottish Association of Landlords, put safety of their tenants paramount. But what I would say as well, as they seek to hardwire smoke alarms and the commitments that they now have, is you have to make sure they are given due time to do that in a robust, safe an affordable manner, and the landlords I work with are up for doing that. But perhaps some more clarity around that would be welcome. In the minute and a half that I, I have left, I want to just make some general comments about ideas around the flexibility of allocation policies of landlords. And I'm not going to actually talk about age-related criteria, but I'm going to speak about something that is one of the biggest constituency issues I have. I have some people in appalling housing conditions whose housing needs can be met by social landlords, but they don't take that house because they know when they take that house, they will be stuck in that house for a generation or two generations because in social housing, once your housing needs are met, your housing aspirations tend to be forgotten about. So in terms of that flexibility, as a Mary Hill housing officer said to me a number of years ago, he said to me, Bob, it used to be a case we said to a social tenant, you know, I know you don't really want that property, but do a couple of years up the close and we'll get you a much better property in a couple of years' time. Well, in, for a number of years now, if you do your time up a close, as long as your housing needs are been met, you'll stay up that close for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So just when we look at flexibility of our, our allocation policies, I would ask Parliament and the Minister to give cognizance to the fact of how you put the housing journey and the housing aspiration of social rented tenants as part of that flexibility. And talking about flexibility, presiding officer, I'm going to give you an extra 10 seconds because that's me finished. <laughs> I am grateful. John Lamont, followed by Marco Biaggi. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Um, I welcome this opportunity to contribute to a stage one debate on this um, important bill. I do so because housing is probably the single biggest issue that constituents in my borders constituency um, contact me about. I'm sure the same is true for many other members um, across the parliament. In particular, the, the issue that concerns my constituents most is the frustration that local people often cannot secure social housing in their own communities. They are forced to apply for and often take housing in some of the larger towns um, across the borders, which, in many, which may be several miles from the rest of their family and community. It might also be some distance from their place of work. 
This does not always support the aim of the local housing associations to encourage a cohesive community. A few miles may not sound a lot, but I think it's important to recognise that in rural communities like the Borders, the difference between living in Eyemouth or Duns, Jebra or Erlston can be, for many people, profound and significant. Try asking a family from Hoyk to live to Ngala Shields or vice versa. I believe it is important, therefore, that the Bill is amended to give social landlords the ability, to, the ability to include extra priority for applicants with a local connection. I am not saying that this should be an ace card that should take priority over every other factor. Clearly, those applicants who are homeless or have a particular medical need still need to be given um, the relevant priority. However, where all other things are equal, I believe that a local connection should be taken in, into account in the allocations process. It is therefore my intention to move amendments at stage two um, to cover this issue. I fully accept that the concept of, of local will be different in each part of Scotland. What is local in the borders will be a completely different concept to what local might be defined as um, in Glasgow. I hope that my amendment will ensure that the definition of local is sufficiently flexible to accommodate the requirements of the different needs of Scotland. Now, in the remaining time um, available to me, I wish to mention the other concern um, which has been raised with me by constituents, and that is the Bill's provisions to reform the site licensing system for mobile home sites with permanent residents. I represent several such sites, including Springwood Village near Kelso. <clears throat> I have been in correspondence with the Minister um, about this issue and she is well aware of the concerns that both the site owner and the residents have and I will not repeat them now. However, the key point is that whilst the intention may well be to target unscrupulous site owners who have sought to exploit weaknesses in the current licensing regime, it could have the opposite effect. I will cite a couple of important um, examples. Firstly, the proposal to have a three-year um, licence term for site licences. I know that the committee also highlighted concerns that financial lenders may withdraw support for sites on the basis of the introduction of fixed term licences. Now, many of my constituents have invested large sums of money in their homes and this should not be un undermined by the imposition of this fixed term licence period. Like the committee, I would encourage the Scottish Government to work with the lending groups to clarify what their views are on the introduction of a fixed term three year licence. Given the concerns that have been raised with me, I will be using stage two to move an amendment to increase the fixed term to at least five years. Now, there are other aspects of the bill um, intended for site licensing which raises concerns, not least um, in relation to the fit and proper person test. I would be grateful if the Minister could clarify in her closing remarks whether the Government has looked at the experiences from England in terms of the drafting behind these um, provisions. Um, presiding officer, there is much in this bill that we can support. There are areas that need um, significant improvement. But as my colleague Alex Johnson has already explained, the fundamental flaw in this bill is the abolition of the right to buy. Many of my constituents will be deeply d disappointed by the removal of this right. But, presiding officer, I fully recognise that this is a minority view in this chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lamont. Mark Berger, followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise as the elected representative of 31,000 people uh, whose roof over their head is paid for by a monthly bill to a private landlord. At 39%, Edinburgh Central's rental share has doubled in a decade and is the highest in Scotland. The private rent sector has long been the choice of students, new migrants and those who work in transient occupations. But today it is also now the only option for the families locked out of social housing by the plummeting council house numbers that were the effect of right to buy and for the younger generations priced out of buying their own home by two decades of soaring house prices which happened while any concerns were drowned out by backslapping from mid-market self-congratulations by those lucky enough to buy in less turbocharged times. This new report from Shelter out this month confirms that just one in six people in the private rented sector actually want to be there. How ironic it is that Thatcher's dream of home ownership was followed by a housing crisis hangover and home ownership falling for the first time in living memory. With little security of tenure, city centre communities have become more transient and services long cherished by long-term residents have had to be changed in the face of understandably deep sentiment to reflect the, the replacement of families with children 
with HMOs. I don't say that as a criticism, but as a recognition. Cities change, living patterns change. They always have, they always will. The question is how we adapt and how we manage. We now have landlord registration. We now have independent tenancy deposit protection and tenancy information packs. And the illegal premiums, formerly being charged by 59 out of 60 Edinburgh letting agents surveyed, charges to even get on a waiting list or even be considered for a flat, have been ended. But in a market failure, when supply is quite literally fixed and unmoving and demand is ever increasing, it's not just right, but it's actually vital that we intervene to deal with the inevitable unfairness that the imbalance would create. The private rented sector tribunal will speed up adjudication, as well as crucially providing a specialist space and avoiding the need for tenants and landlords to go to the sheriff court for enforcement. But the, the landlord-tenant relationship is an intrinsically precarious one when it can be ended at any point with little warning by the landlord. No wonder it's so easy for tenants to feel they are living in someone else's asset rather than their own home. No wonder either that private rented homes are often of the lowest quality and have the poorest maintenance, with implications not least for neighbours. Tenants have told me time and time again of their fears of trying to press their rights, of struggling to find a lawyer willing to take on their case, apprehension at possibly being blacklisted by other letting agents as a troublemaker. And for the new arrivals to Scotland, it is especially hard. Giving local authorities the power to inspect and report on the repairing standard will help address this. Giving the power to neighbours could help even more, and I would be interested to hear the Minister's response to that suggestion from Edinburgh. Thirdly, regulation of letting agents means good practice may become standard practice. Implemented well and the new tribunal will be out of a job. We can look forward to empty rooms and bored lawyers because the disputes won't emerge. Too much to hope for, maybe. But we should all welcome that letting agents too support this move because they also realise the importance of the industry being in high repute. This bill's provisions will help this country govern a private rented sector that is groaning under the weight of a massive expansion. But I believe we must also look at the horizon and consider what we want the mix of housing ownership and tenure to look like in another decade's time. Yesterday, the EET committee heard accounts of inequality in Scotland and the UK and a crucial reminder to consider both inequality of income and inequality of wealth. The implication in private renting is fairly straightforward. A private tenant has fewer assets than their landlord and the gap between them grows with every monthly rental payment. In the short term, we must ensure rights and responsibilities on both sides are enforced and continue the commendable progress in increasing the supply of social housing. But let us all take a moment to imagine a society where the proportion of people renting the roof over their head has doubled again. Is that a future where equality is lower or higher? Where communities are more cohesive or more atomised? And above all, is that the Scotland that in another 10 years we all want to live in? Thank you, Mr. Biagi. We've got a few seconds in hand, so if members want to take an intervention, we can give a wee bit back. Alec Rowley, followed by Sandra White. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As a, as a councillor, the, the highest caseload that, that I run with was all relating to housing issues. And I've found, as an MSP since uh, January, that the highest caseload I have now in dealing with constituents' issues is housing. And the fact is that we do have a major housing crisis out there that needs to be tackled. And I can come back to that. Um, but it is the case that I welcome um, what's been proposed today in terms of the bill that's come forward. I would congratulate Maureen Watt and the committee for the work that they have done because I think some of the stuff that they've brought forward looks to bring about improvement. I would also, um, I was pleased to hear Jim Eadie talk about the, the Shelter Scotland um, proposals in terms of removing uh, from the draft bill the, the social landlords discriminate against future tenants based on age. 
I think certainly in Fife there is local letting policies and local area committees are able to determine them. So at the local level it seems most appropriate and I certainly would support Jim in bringing that forward. In terms of temporary accommodation and strengthening the existing protection for families with children, I did experience two Decembers ago um, a family, a, a young mum and, and three kids stuck in temporary accommodation above a pub for, for two months coming up to Christmas. Uh, it was totally unacceptable. I'm told that it wouldn't happen again in five, but we should make sure it doesn't happen and that young families have the opportunity um, to, to question that. So in terms, in terms of these proposals that's brought forward, I would also pick up on the point for, for Bob Doris, because I think absolutely it's about having ambition in terms of housing and not simply being told that your housing requirements are adequately housed and therefore you're stuck in a flat or whatever. And actually, if we've got some flexibility there, and I hope the Minister uh, will take on board the points that Bob makes, because they're absolutely valid points. You know, I was born and brought up in a council house, and for years it was, it was my mum's ambition that we would move further down the street into a cottage in Kelty, um, and eventually we did. That was the reality at then. So it should be about choice for council tenants, not a position of last resort. Um, so I welcome, I welcome um, the proposals that have come forward and I welcome the debate that has taken place today and particularly the private sector. Um, but I would say if local authorities, it's not just about having discretionary powers to try and intervene. I've dealt with many cases over the years of private landlords and while there would no doubt is good private landlords out there, there's also a lot that leave the condition of their houses in, in a state that's unacceptable. And when you meet families that are having to live in those conditions, so local authorities need to have the powers to be able to act and be able to recover any monies if they're forced from private landlords to actually get the work done that's necessary within those houses and I would also appeal to the Minister for that point of view. But the bottom line is that that all said and people coming to my surgeries tomorrow with housing issues is that there is not enough housing to go around. And that's why I do support Shelter in their campaign for an additional 10,000 socially rented houses to be built a year. It's important, I think, that we do build houses. In Fife's case, they were able to work with tenants, raise the funds, and they now have a plan in place over the next five years for 2,700 houses to be built in Fife. We need to get a partnership with local authorities to build more houses. In 2013, at the end of March, there was 151,000 people on the waiting list in Scotland. And there were 31, almost 32,000 households that were accepted by the local authorities as being homeless. And there were over 18,000 children in households accepted as homeless. That is the type of crisis, and that is the crisis that, the crisis that we do have in Scotland. Now, I know that the Scottish Government has set targets in their manifesto for 6,000 affordable homes, but originally they talked about 6,000 socially rented homes. And I think that is the key, and that is the fundamental. We can welcome the, the bill and some of the stuff that's been put in there, but imagine if we could build part of unity and real ambition right across Scotland. I'm ambition that we tackle the housing problems that's out there. We build new houses and that then creates a chain and frees up so that people can get the type of, meet the housing needs that they actually have by signing up and looking at the 10,000 new houses per year and put the resources in to do that. And I think that's the way forward. It's be, be about being ambitious, having an ambitious housing programme, a national housing programme for Scotland, sign up to Shelters campaign, 10,000 socially rented houses per year. Let's start moving forward and we'll tackle the housing needs in Scotland. Many thanks. I now call on Sandra White to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And uh, can I thank the Infrastructure Capital Investment Committee for their scrutiny of this bill. And the, although I'm not a member of the committee, uh, like all MSPs, I think they've mentioned already, is that uh, housing, uh, both social and private, make up probably the, the largest part of uh, mine and other MSPs' constituency work. I want to touch on a couple of areas. And can I say I thought that the, the debate so far has, has been very good and it's been con you know, basically 
There has not been a lot of controversy there, but unfortunately, I think Mary Fee, uh, in her opening remarks, I think Mary uh, Fee certainly, as far as I was concerned, set off uh, in the wrong foot. And I hope I'll correct her in some of the comments that I'm going to make. Uh, the first one I want to touch on is ending the right to buy. And I think it is really vital that we increase the supply of social housing, uh, not only to safeguard the stock for future generations, but also allow communities to stay together. I think that's what we all want, to stay together and also to flourish. Now, in my constituency, social housing is at a, a real premium. Indeed, when pressurised areas were introduced into the Parliament of part uh, of Kelvin constituency, benefited greatly from this particular part of the legislation under pressurised areas. And I do congratulate the Scottish Government for building 4,000, I would hope you would listen to this, uh, Mary, 4,432 new council houses in the past six years, compared to six Yes, six council houses under the previous Labour Liberal coalition. I think we have to be clear about that. 26,242 housing association houses have also been built in the last six years under the Scottish Government. So I think credit where credit is actually due. Yes, I'll take an intervention. Mary Fee. Would the member acknowledge that the 29% cut in real terms in the housing budget in four years by this Government has had a massive detrimental impact on housing in this country. Sandra White. Re remind me, if you, I did say I think we should be honest and we should give credit, but credit is due. Six houses, six houses in four years, please. Six houses. I think that's something that you should be honest, honest about. A little bit of courtesy, and can ladies. I, can, can I echo John Mason's comments in regards to uh, local connections and housing policy? And can I assure John Lament that areas in my Glasgow constituency, whilst I don't have countryside and all of them round about them <clears throat> it's not that different from your area where people from Partick and other areas ask me about local connections because the communities want to stay together and as I said before uh, you know the continuity uh, helps them flourish as well uh, so I just wanted to put that point in as well but one of the biggest issues in my area is the private sector uh, and I want to keep my remarks for that now like Gordon MacDonald and Marco Biaggi uh, my constituency of Glasgow Kelvin contains many Many, many private sector landlords and I do re re welcome the recommendations laid out in the bill, in particular the transfer from Sheriff Court to first tier tribunals in private housing cases. Uh, this is also welcomed by the Scottish Association of Landlords who have highlighted uh, basically the problems of using courts in housing disputes. So they welcome that and I welcome it also. The next one I want to touch on is the poor conditions in the private sector and also welcome the Minister's comments in regards to local authorities being given more powers in this area. Now, having a constituency with, you know, many, many tenemental properties, some over 100 years old, uh, many with absent landlords, many operating as HMOs, I think it's really important that this particular area is tackled. And I do also welcome the Minister's comments in regards to bringing forward amendments to the bill in regards to electrical checks and carbon monoxide detectors. Now, in my particular area, yes, I echo what Marco Biaggi had also said, city centre areas and other areas, yes, they have to change through time. But the amount of private sector housing where people speculate, as I would say, have bought up properties during what they might call the property boom and cannot sell them, they are now operating as private landlords, very, very many of them absent tea private landlords and very, very difficult for people to actually get a hold of them when a repair is needing done or even anything a meeting is needing done. So I think that's something that's very, very good that we're looking at legislating against that as well. Now, the one thing that hasn't been mentioned in the report and possibly we may look at it hopefully as it progresses, the bill progresses through, is the link between planning and HMOs. And I know it's a council issue, but it's brought up daily uh, you know, with me, with uh, many of my uh, constituents. And also a thing that may be quite small, but it isn't to people who are living there. In an HMO, the dividing of rooms up, where once it might have been a bedroom, now becomes a living room or a kitchen. 
Now, I can tell you, if you're living below an HMO where once your bedroom was and you now have a living room which contains four or five people, it's very, very horrendous, really. The experiences are horrendous. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. Now, I know this hasn't been mentioned in this report, but I would hope that the two issues that I've raised at the end there could perhaps be progressed as the bill goes through. And as I said, I'm not a member of the committee, but I'll certainly be keeping an eye on it and hopefully I can speak in stage two or stage three debate also. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. Now, call on Patrick Harvey to be followed by Adam Ingram. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As others have said, there's not a great deal that's actually in this bill to which people are objecting. The two broad exceptions to that are some of the criteria around social housing provision, age and other factors, and I do hope to see those debated at stage two uh, with some willingness from the government to at least look uh, with a, a, a an, op an open mind to amendments that come forward. And the other, of course, on the right to buy. And notwithstanding the anguished cry of the thwarted libertarian uh, on the front benches there, who seemed at times to be doing a passable parody of Alex Johnson, notwithstanding those concerns, I think most of us are pretty happy to wave bye-bye to the right to buy. We know it's long overdue. We know also that it won't transform things overnight. The damage done by the right to buy was long-term damage, the long-term erosion of the socially rented sector. The benefit that will come from abolishing it will be long-term benefit as well. It won't happen overnight, but it will be long-term benefit. That benefit will be maximised if at the same time we take heed of the call that's come from several parts of the chamber to begin real investment in increasing the supply of social rented housing. If we're going to arrest the erosion of it, we need also to invest in the increased supply. That's the way to get the real long-term benefit. And uh, as for uh, Mr. Mr. Lamont, I think he might want to have a word with his colleague about why so many of his constituents and all of our constituents don't have access to enough social housing. Why did we flog the stuff off in the first place if we, if we have those concerns today in his part of the country or any other? Most of my concerns are around the private rented sector. And the private rented sector tenants, as Marco Biaggi rightly pinpoints, are very often stuck between the unavailability of social housing on the one side and the unaffordability of owner occupation on the other. This is no longer a free choice for very many people who are in the private rented sector. And I don't think we can afford to treat it merely as a contract between free individual private citizens. For very many people in Scotland, this is the only form of housing our society provides for them, the private rented sector. And we have a responsibility to ensure that it is affordable, that it is high quality. In effect, I think we should regulate it as social provision, because it's the only provision people have available to them. If that was the approach that the government was taking, they wouldn't have ruled out looking at issues like security of tenure in this bill. I know that they're doing longer term work on that and I do hope that the Minister is able to commit to legislation on that at least at some point during this parliamentary session because insecure tenure is one of the factors that underpins the imbalance of power between landlords and tenants and that's the core of the problem that we're trying to address. Nor would the government have ruled out dealing at some level with rent prices as well. Rental levels in some parts of the country are just silly money at the moment. We don't need a sledgehammer to crack that, but at least in certain areas where there is a clear demonstrable problem, uh, an approach to, to controlling rents uh, I think is justified, particularly at a time when interest rates remain low. Those who are so privileged to own more property than they need to house themselves and their families can hardly justify charging the kind of steadily increasing rent levels that many private tenants who have no other choice in society other than staying in the private rented sector are forced to pay. There are other aspects where I think this bill could go further. We've talked about the code of practice. Now, the, the regulation of letting agents is a good step, a welcome step. And I, I'm very happy to see that the government is bringing that forward. We absolutely have to ensure that it achieves more and more effectively than the registration of landlords achieved. 
Registration of landlords itself was a good step, but it didn't deliver on everything that was promised of it, partly because of resourcing and enforcement, but also, I think in many cases, because tenants didn't necessarily know the benefits that that could give them. They didn't necessarily know their rights. We mustn't repeat the same mistakes with the regulation of letting agents. So let's hear, at stage two, amendments that actually put clarity into the bill about what that code of practice can deliver. I'd like it to see the widespread uh, discrimination against welfare recipients, benefit recipients, addressed in the code of practice. We know that it's widespread. I'd like to see the ongoing problem with even reputable professional letting agents finding workarounds to get around the, uh, uh, the deposit uh, protection scheme provisions. We know that a widespread practice is simply to pretend that they're not charging a deposit and call it an increased advance rent or other, other workarounds. And we do need to see that the code of practice puts an end to those kind of um, loopholes that many uh, letting agents are trying to find their way around. All of this, even if we get the best code of practice that we can, all of this begs one final question, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it's this. Why on earth should tenants who rent from a landlord instead of a letting agent have to expect any lower standard of service? If we're going to achieve that high standard of service for tenants of letting agents, why not apply it to the tenants of landlords as well? That way we'll be ensuring that private sector provision is what it needs to be for all of the people who depend on it in Scotland. Many thanks. I now call on Adam Ingram to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, as Deputy Convener of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee, I'm pleased to make a contribution to today's debate, albeit as a tail-end Charlie, whose points have already been covered to a considerable extent by others. Now, the main headline measure in the Bill is obviously the abolition of the right to buy for social housing tenants which has been warmly welcomed by everyone except the Tories, of course. Uh, so much so, we are asking the government to reduce the lead-in period to, to ab abolition, and I'm pleased uh, that the Minister has responded positively on this issue, and hopefully we can encourage her to move even faster. As the, the Law Society points out in its briefing for this debate, the exercise of this right over the years since 1980 has reduced the availability of good quality affordable housing in the public sector. Some 455,000 properties have been taken out uh, of the sector in that period. 500,000 tenants still have a right to buy and with more than 185,000 people on local authority waiting lists, continuing depletion of the social housing stock is unsustainable in the face of this level of need. And of course, abolition of right to buy is not just about retaining what's left of social housing, but it will remove one of the main constraints on social landlords seeking to expand supply. And I have to say, thanks to this Scottish Government, nearly 31,000 social houses have been completed in the six years to 2013, despite the cuts in austerity imposed by Westminster. I appreciate what Alex Rowley was saying about the need for, to go even further, but we need to have the resources available for that purpose. And I also I'd like to point out uh, to others that a significantly, this is a significantly better performance than the Labour-led predecessor in the previous six years, when the Scottish budget was actually growing in real terms year on year. And that contrast is particularly remarkable when it comes to council house building. 4,400 new council houses built by, by the SNP, and as Sandra White mentioned, just six under the last four years of the Labour Lib Dem administration. I'll take an intervention. Yes. James Kelly. I mean, I know he wants to uh, support his government's record, but we can do out such a disingenuous claptrap. He ignores the fact... 
ignores the fact that the Labour Lib Dem administration built thousands of housing association houses and over the six year, if you compare the figures over the, the six year periods, 144,000 houses completed 2001 to 2006 in Scotland compared to 112,000 in the last six years. Let's get the facts right. Adam Ingram. Well, uh, as the First Minister is fond of saying, facts are chills that win a ding, and I suggest uh, that Mr Kelly has a look at completions of housing association houses, and he'll find there are more under an SNP government than under the Labour administrations in previous years. And of course, moving on, uh, uh, presiding officer, under independence and freedom from UK Treasury rules, we will be able to do much more. But can I say the bill covers other important issues? And given the time I have left, uh, I want to concentrate on just one relating to a change in factors which may be considered in allocating social housing. Specifically, the removal of the prohibition of taking age into account. This measure was requested by the Chartered Institute of Housing Scotland to allow landlords the ability to discriminate appropriately to deal with specific circumstances. Examples included excluding young people from multi-storey uh, tower blocks with a large proportion of older tenants with associated support groups and social activities specifically suited to older residents, or limiting allocations to younger age groups in particular areas where there is already a preponderance of young or vulnerable people to create a more balanced community. The measure is also supported by the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, who emphasise that age and lifestyle are critical factors in developing sustainable communities. On the other hand, there is significant opposition to this change. Uh, not at the moment, uh, Jim. Uh, Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People believe a number of vulnerable groups are likely to be disproportionately affected. Those include young disabled people, care leavers and young single parents. And certainly research has shown that housing allocated to young people on leaving care was often unsuitable and in deprived areas where they were surrounded by adverse social conditions, including drugs, alcohol, and violence. And while, whilst overt discrimination based on age is unlawful under the Equality Act, this more subtle form of discrimination can and does operate against housing allocation that is entirely fair and based purely on need. Now, the committee has identified this as a key issue and called on the Scottish Government to monitor the application of this provision in practice. Personally, I would like to see stronger safeguards built into the bill and would encourage the Minister to work with the Commissioner and bodies like Shelter to achieve that objective through appropriate amendments to the bill in future stages. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Well, thank you very much, Mr Agnew. Now call on Sarah Boyack after which we move to closing speeches. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Well, I very much welcome the fact that we're debating this bill this afternoon, and I particularly look forward to seeing the raft of amendments that have been suggested from across the Chamber. Um, I particularly welcome the very practical suggestions that were made by the committee members who had scrutinised this bill in detail, and I think those amendments would go a long way to strengthen the bill. I think the challenge is that the bill won't be enough and when I, I sit and reflect on the comments that people are making about housing allocation policies, about sufficient housing for young people, about people with disabilities, and crucially, older people who are going to make up more and more of our population and who have every right to safe, uh, sustainable communities. At the end of the day, the key problem here is lack of housing choice. It's lack of appropriate properties, it's lack of affordable properties, and it's lack of access to communities. And I think that is what underpins 
all the comments that people have been making about uh, local access, about age issues and about antisocial behaviour. A lot of this goes down to the lack of decent housing that is available for people. And I think that's why the various parts of this bill, um, some of them do need to be strengthened because we don't just need to um, build more houses, we need to make sure that our uh, support is given to the management of the housing sector. I think that affordability and lack of house choice type goes to the heart of this and that's why lack of supply and affordability is so crucial and members right across the chamber have talked about that. So this bill has to be seen in the context of the need for more housing. And I, I think that affordable housing is, is crucially needed, but we do also need private housing for sale as well. I think the point was made by Marco Biagi about lack of choice. A lot of people are in the private rented sector in Edinburgh because there simply isn't any affordable housing to buy or to rent. And we need a proper designated social housing provision in the city as well. Um, and I, I just want to make a brief point that James Kelly quite rightly intervened um, on Adam Ingram there. The point about the first eight years of the Scottish Parliament was a huge amount of time was put into improving the quality of social and council housing, as well as building social housing. And you look at the investment in Glasgow, the best part of a billion pounds in bringing that council housing stock up to quality. Those things are, were absolutely crucial and they were deliberate priorities in the first eight years of this Parliament. I want to focus on a couple of the sections where I think there are some um, very helpful suggestions in this bill that I think need to be strengthened. Um, if I look at the private rented sector in particular, um, like all the MSPs from Edinburgh, the Lothians, I, I do want to focus on the issue about improving the private rented sector. I've campaigned for this for years and I'm delighted to see that there are now provisions in this bill. I think I just want to make sure that they go far enough. Um, I particularly want to focus on the comments others have made about flexibility for councils for paybacks, where they have taken up the missing share, where residents have got together, have come up with a plan, um, where they've used the, the law of the tenement um, provisions, where they've come up with a proper plan for investment in their tenement or their communally owned building and people have opted out. We need to make sure that we can chase absent owners effectively and I think uh, a little bit more work needs to be done in the bill to make sure that's effective. But the flexibility issue is crucial because if you're living in common owned property, it's not a point about investing every 30 years. If you're living in those buildings, you're probably needing to invest in the property every five, every 10, every 15, every 20 years. It's about regular repairs and maintenance. When we have the huge problems we've had in Edinburgh because of lack of maintenance, that means it becomes a lottery as to who happens to be owning the property at that time. We need to get all owners uh, the capacity to improve their properties. We need to make it fair and I think councils are crucial. The point made by Malcolm Chisholm about enabling local authorities to do this with a pot of money to get things going I think would certainly get things um, moving and it would tackle the backlog that we've clearly got in key parts of Scotland. Um, another area that I would like to focus on in terms of repairs and improvements, um, I think there's an issue about um, the private rented sector in terms of quality. Several people have talked about that. There is a real issue in terms of energy efficiency. In the Labour debate uh, yesterday, a key issue is the private rented sector. Now, we passed the Climate Change Act unanimously five years ago. It's not right that new housing is of good quality in terms of environmental efficiency, that the social rented sector is leading the way, I would argue, in terms of energy efficiency, both in new and in existing stock, but the private sector misses out. That means that people who are saving up to buy a house, that means that people are waiting for social housing to become available, are absolutely penalised. And if you look at the rises in energy costs, those people are not uh, getting a good deal. And I really think we need to focus on that. So that's a key issue that needs to be tackled. That's not currently in the bill. And I think um, I'd be very keen to hear from the minister if she's prepared to work with us to look for amendments um, so that we can improve that issue. We need to make sure that we get the right amount of housing stock. We need to get stable mixed communities. Um, the one point I would make about um, the whole council sales issue is that 
Housing associations are now looking at staircasing. They are looking at enable people to take part ownership. I think there's opportunities with cooperative housing that are not being fully explored at the moment. I would be keen to see more of that. But the, the delivery of access to people owning their houses was not delivered by um, access to um, being able to buy people's council houses. And you can see that in the communities where those properties, the first generation sold their properties um, so I bought their properties and were able to benefit from that. But many of those houses were sold off and they're now run by private landlords, which gets us back to the point about improving the quality of housing and particularly focus, focusing on the private re rented sector. I think in this parliament, that would be something that we could do. If we could do it together and we could do it at stage two so we get the detail right, I think that would greatly strengthen this bill and mean that it's the bill that it needs to be rather than the bill it currently is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we now move to the closing speeches. I call on Alex Johnston. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this has been a constructive debate, uh, but it will go down for a number of good reasons, not least which is it got us a mention of Margaret Thatcher once again, something which is increasingly rare in this chamber on this occasion, not even by me personally. Uh, so it's always nice to have a little support. Uh, I, along with others, uh, in our opening speech, uh, contributions to the debate, talked largely about the bill itself. However, as the debate has progressed, we've moved slightly to talk about the backdrop against which this bill appears. And that's not always the right thing to do in a debate, but I think it's been very constructive and positive and takes us forward uh, in a very positive way. There have been a number of uh, speeches which I would like to comment on and try to develop my ideas against the, the criteria that were set out. And I think it was Marco Biaggi uh, who, in his contribution, which I thought was a sound argument for private ownership, if ever there was one, uh, actually began to talk about the shape of the private rented market. Because too often we've concentrated uh, exclusively on the social rented sector and the contrib contribution of the, the public and private sector to that. But there's more to the, the rented se rental sector in Scotland than simply that. And in cities like Edinburgh and Aberdeen, which is closer to home for me, there is a high-end rental market uh, where there are extremely high-quality properties uh, rented at extremely high prices. So there is an interesting shape to the rental market, and one that we should take into account when we think about what's going on in some of our cities. Now, it's my contention that the, the notion of social rented housing that we take so seriously today is something that was effectively created by the 2001 Act. Uh, prior to that, we thought of our uh, public housing provision uh, slightly differently. The problem we have in the marketplace today is that we have no middle to the rented market. We have the high end, we have the social rented sector, and we have virtually nothing in between. I think there is a significant and serious lack of mid-market rental opportunity in Scotland today. Alec Rowley spoke at some length about how he would like to see 10,000 socially rented houses uh, built a year in Scotland. Well, I would like to see that kind of housing availability in Scotland, but I wouldn't argue that we need to build 10,000 socially rented houses. Because if there was a mid middle to the rental market, I suspect many people who currently occupy in the social rented sector would choose to move up into that rental opportunity, paying slightly higher rents for a different type of property, and by d in doing so, freeing up capacity in the social rented sector. I think it's therefore, I will in a second, I think it's therefore vital that the government considers uh, against the background of this housing bill how it might stimulate investment and development in that sector because I know that there is private money or institutional money ready to be invested if local authorities have the confidence to take that forward. Yeah. Patrick okay. Harvey. Thank you for giving way. Can I suggest that if the issue of security of tenure in the private rented sector had been addressed, there might just be something in what he said. But at present, what on earth would possess people to move from the social rented sector by choice, if that's available to them, into a sector where they can be given a month's notice to quit without reason? 
Alex Jones. I think the problem we have there is the deep-seated one that there is a, a mistrust of the private rented sector. Scotland is full of very positive uh, private landlords who are willing to work very c closely uh, with their tenants in order to achieve their objective. In fact, I was hypothesising there about how we might get private or institutional investment in public housing in the mid-market sector. The only way that investment can ever be secure is if we have good houses with good tenants in them. A good house with a good tenant in it is worth more to an investor than one without a tenant. And as a consequence, there is a vested interest in supporting long-term tenancies in that context. Moving on slightly, uh, we had the usual argument, which takes place quite often in this chamber, about who built the most houses over the last 10 years. I've acted as referee in this one before, and I'm going to do it again because I don't like seeing people taking advantage of each other. The truth is that if it's a case that Labour only built six council houses, what we forget is that Labour, uh, with the Liberal Democrat allies, were in government in Scotland at a time when we saw a flourishing of the, the, the housing associations in Scotland. There were a huge number of houses built, but they were built by housing associations. And it is foolish of us to discount that uh, effort that went on. So, no, there were not only six social houses built in Scotland. There were many, many more. And at the same time, the SNP in government today claim consistently that they have built thousands of council houses. Well, can I just correct them there? It was the councils that built the houses, and this government has, if anything, undermined the councils who would wish to build by cutting the housing budget. Marco how, how many council houses would those councils have built without the reforms to right to buy? Alex Jones. I think you could argue how, how, lo how long is a piece of string? But it's, I, I thank Marco Biaggi for bringing me back to the issue of right to buy. We have, during the course of this debate, heard time and time again the accusation made that right to buy is somehow depleting the number of houses that are available for social rent. I would argue against that, and I will begin now to introduce some figures uh, to base uh, on which I base my initial remarks. In your final 45 seconds. The truth is that the modernised right to buy of the 1,500 houses uh, that were sold in the last full year of available information, only 347 were under the modernised right to buy. 1,173 of these houses were in the pre-2001 preserved right to buy. These were people who had been tenants of their existing property for more than 12 years, many of them significantly longer. I, have, I maintain the hypothesis that those who have exercised the right to buy are people who were long-term tenants and, if they did not buy, would remain long-term tenants and that these houses will not be freed up by ending the right to buy. What as will happen as a result of this change is that we will see a rush to buy from people who see a right being taken away from them. And by this government's own criteria, that will be counterproductive. Many thanks. And I now call on James Kelly. Up to nine minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to close the debate um, and thank the uh, committee and the witnesses and clerks for the work that they put in to the production of the Stage 1 report that we're uh, debating this afternoon. There's no doubt that uh, Alec Rowley and Patrick Harvey are absolutely correct. The biggest issue in housing just now in Scotland is the, the lack of supply. Um, there is a crisis in, uh, in housing in Scotland. People have quoted the statistics about the lowest number of completions since uh, 1947, the rising waiting lists. But it's not just a question of the statistics. Uh, anyone who sits at their, their uh, surgeries uh, gets a big up, uptake in housing cases, and we see that lack of supply coming through our surgery and our constituency doors. And if you don't acknowledge that, uh, you're not facing up to the truth in relation to housing. Uh, it also ha does have to be put on the record that the reality is that the, the SNP government have, over a period of time, 
cut the housing budgets by 30 per cent and also cut HAG levels. I know they've uh, restored them slightly again, but you know, if you talk to housing, just let me finish this point, Mr. Doris, and I'll let you in. Um, but if you talk to housing associations, they'll tell you that the current le level of uh, HAG funding is inadequate, uh, and that undermines their ability uh, to go forward uh, with uh, house building in their areas, Mr. Doris. Doris. Thank you for inter uh, taking the intervention. I'm not going to trade figures with the member, but can you tell me, you make the point that additional resources can achieve additional housing. So rather than the rhetoric, can you identify the additional resources Labour will commit to deliver additional housing so we've got something to look at, Mr Kelly? James uh, Kelly. I think he makes an, an absolutely valid point. You know, I've said previously that you know, rather than the millions of pounds that the SNP are spending on supporting the referendum process, I would rather see that. Uh, I would rather see that you know, used on purposeful uh, house building in our communities. But I think, and the, the other point, the other point I would make, uh, the other point I would make, this is a serious point. We've got, we've all got an onus on us to look at alternative funding mechanisms for, for uh, councils and housing associations. It's not all going to come from the Scottish government budget. You know, for example, um, you know, pension funds have been looked at in certain sectors uh, as a, an opportunity to provide uh, house building programmes. And that's something that maybe the, the, the Minister should be examining. Um, the, what, the, what the Minister really needs to do is acknowledge that supply is an issue. Uh, and what we've, we've uh, uh, said previously, we would work with the SNP on this, uh, but we need to address these, that substantive issue. The bill in itself, um, there's not a lot in it to you know, necessarily disagree with. I agree with the contributions people have made that it could be strengthened in certain areas. Um, but you know, that doesn't address the issues that are going on in crisis uh, in Scotland uh, currently where housing is in crisis. Uh, I mean, to an extent, you know, Jim Eady said that the right, abolishing the right to buy was the centrepiece of the bill. Uh, I don't oppose that provision, but you know, if that is only going to uh, stop 1,500 houses a year uh, leaving the social housing sector, then it's making a minimal impact uh, in terms of addressing the 151,000 people on the social housing uh, waiting lists. So there are big issues to be addressed here. I think, uh, as a number of people have pointed out, Marco Biagi charted the rise of the private rented sector. Uh, you know, we've seen in recent times, uh, you know, because of the difficulty in accessing mortgage, the lack of proper uh, social housing, many people have had to turn to the private rented sector. And that's seen, that's seen an increase from 8% of the market to 12% of the market. And as Marco Biagi pointed out, many, many people uh, in that sector you know, they don't want to be in the private rented sector. They would rather have the opportunity uh, to own their own home. They've been, they've been driven there. Um, and, you know, we, th th that th therefore gives you, you know, consequential issues. Um, and that there's then a much bigger role for letting agents. There are, as Bob Doris pointed out, responsible letting agents. But many of us come across letting agents who aren't quite as uh, scrupulous uh, and responsible. And I think from that point of view, the, the bill could be important in providing regulation of letting agents, but you know, it's got to be robust uh, and it's got to have teeth. There's got to be a process so that we can see that these letting agents are accredited when they go onto the register. Um, you know, Alec Johnson acknowledged that you know, he thought it was a good scheme because of the support of the industry. I think the test on it is, does it have the support of the tenants uh, out in our communities? I think it will only have the proper support of the tenants if they see that there's transparency about it and that there's the ability to take action against rogue uh, letting agents and have them removed uh, from the, the register. I think the other issue around the private rented sector is uh, rent levels. Mary Fee mentioned that in certain areas the, the, the rents in the private sector were double what they were in the social sector. Uh, and I think there's a, a problem, as some have said, around uh, tenure. And I think the, the issue for people in the private rented sector, if they get into uh, accommodation and they feel 
you know, reasonably secure in the area, uh, and suddenly the landlord uh, comes along and puts the, the rent up, uh, they maybe have very little recourse, you know, because they don't have an option to move elsewhere. So I think there is a, an issue around rent levels, and I think that's something that we should look at examining in stage two uh, of the bill. Uh, Mark Griff some of the other issues, Mark Griffin mentioned uh, antisocial behaviour. That is a big issue uh, in a lot of uh, communities. There are provisions in the bill to try and address that. I think uh, we remain to be seen whether they're, uh, whether they're strong enough for some and fair enough for others. Uh, and we'll need to monitor that as it progresses through stage two. Uh, I actually thought that John Mason made some very reasonable points uh, about the housing regulator. A bit like John Mason, uh, I pick up on ease from housing associations as to the role of the regulator. I know that not all of it can be dealt with in this legislation, but I think there's unease as to the, the transparency with which the regulator is operating and some of the interventions that the housing regulator is making. And I think if there's any ability within the bill uh, to ensure that, that there can be more transparency and we can build more confidence in the role of the regulator, then we should be looking to do that. Uh, the proposals around age uh, have you know, provo proven perhaps among the most controversial aspects of the bill. Uh, in terms of allocation policies are always difficult and sensitive areas. Um, you know, there is a case for looking in terms of allocation that if you're looking to uh, have blocks of housing, as Malcolm Chisholm uh, quoted, where you can have you know, pensioners together where they feel stronger and more secure in communities, there's a case for using an allocation policy for, for that. Uh, but there, there's obviously fear in the way that this has been put forward in that it will uh, unfairly discriminate against young people. Um, so I think we need to, to be wary of that. Uh, in summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, what I would say is that uh, there, was a, there was a family come into my surgery uh, last Monday and uh, they stayed in a one-bedroom flat. There were four adults stayed in the house, only in a one-bedroom flat, clearly an overcrowding situation. They struggled. They were struggling to find alternative housing accommodation. And that is not an unusual case that I deal with in my constituency, with people you know, struggling to access adequate social housing uh, are not able to afford uh, the purchase of a private house. And I think that is the substantial issue that we need to address in housing. Uh, we, will and we will support the general principles of the bill at stage one and try to strengthen it at stage two, but we need substantive uh, action to address the housing crisis in Scotland if we're going to move this issue forward. Many thanks. I now call the Minister Margaret Burgess to wind up the debate. Minister, you have until five o'clock. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. I think, like others, this has been a good debate and there's been a lot of um, constructive contributions from across the chamber and all of which, you know, that I'm certainly listening to. And as I have said, you know, we're still looking at how I'm going to take this forward at stage two. But it also it's encouraging that the lead committee's endorsement of the bill has been reflected uh, in the debate. And I won't be able to respond to all the comments that have been made and all the points that have been made, but I hopefully will get to them in great detail when we consider uh, stage two of the bill. But I just want to kind of start in, in the context, because at the very start, um, when Mary Fee spoke, she suggested that, that the Scottish Government has no vision in housing. And I think we really have to put it in context that this bill is part of, it fits in with our housing vision, which is that all people in Scotland should live in a high quality home that they can afford and is suitable to their needs. And that's set out in our uh, Scottish Government Action Plan, Homes Fit for the 21st Century. And I think that's important we say that. And there's also been criticism that we're not building um, enough homes and there's less homes we've built now than previously. And I think we really have to just nail this one, that this Scottish Government since 2007 has built more council houses than the previous administration and has also built more housing association housing than the previous administration. And we continue to, and I take the points that may, made be James Kelly and Alex Johnson, that we have, of course we have to look at ways of getting more money into the housing sector. And we are doing that. We are looking at pension funds. We've already had a, a local authority announcing that they're using pension funds for housing. So this is going on uh, already. And I think it's important we say that. Senator Blake. 
The, the point I made was it wasn't just about building houses. In the first eight years, it was about the quality of houses, particularly in Glasgow, and that took up the best part of a billion pounds, um, and that, that was a clear priority on our part. Minister? Yeah, well, I think, yes, the standards of housing are higher now, but I want to now move on to the points that have been made during the bill, but I felt I had to put that in context, given um, what, what, what had been said. But a couple of the points that have been made, a number of members have talked about the, the, the letting agents, the, the mandatory um, letting agent list. Now, my intention, absolutely, and I've made this very clear, is that the, the system will have teeth. It will have teeth, and we will enforce it. And three years uh, period for registration, but any problems that arise, even in, in the first year, any problems that arise, we can, that can be considered a breach, it can be a breach, uh, and they can be removed from the list. This is not about you're there for three years, and at the end of the three years, there's a decision taken whether a letting agent is acting appropriately or not. So I think I want to be clear on that. I also want to say, which I didn't get in in my opening remarks because I was running out of time, a bit about the, the mobile home site licensing. And I think um, John Lamont mentioned it as well as Maureen Watt. Um, we are uh, bringing a motion, uh, an amendment forward at stage two, a stage two amendment on the, the terms of the licence from three years to five years. We have listened to the industry in that and the arguments on that, and, and we intend to bring forward a stage two amendment on that. We also intend to bring an amendment uh, to make it absolutely clear that permanent residents can stay in a site if the site owner loses or doesn't renew their licence. We also, I think a number of people highlighted the importance of preventing enforcement costs being passed on to residents, and this was raised by the committee at the session I attended. And this is ne certainly not the government's intention, so we intend to, to explore how we can amend the bill at stage two to ensure that, that cannot happen. A number of members talked about antisocial behaviour, and it is a problem. It's a problem we all recognise. There's no MSP has not had issues in their surgery with antisocial behaviour and we know it can be very sensitive because we've got to get the balance right between um, tenants and being allocating houses to tenants that might need support but also that people can live peacefully in their own home and it is a sensitive issue and the bill and I've said this before that the bill will not resolve antisocial behaviour problems but it's to give landlords a tool of how they can use the, the tenancy regime to be able to effectively manage better or deal better with antisocial behaviour problems and that that's what we hope to achieve with that and and clearly um, we're listening to what's been said here but we hope and we, our stakeholders tell us that they feel that's going to be very useful to them and is something that we welcome. A another point that was raised, I think two people or three people, uh, John Mason uh, and James Kelly, uh, talked about the regulator and we have to be clear and I understand the very issues that were raised. I do know the issues that are out there uh, regarding the feeling in some associations within the sector uh, with the regulator. However, we did decide in 2010 that the regulator should act independently of ministers. So it is not something, and I'll say again, these are issues, yes, the issues that may want to bring up, but firstly, they have to be taken to the regulator and they can't be, it wouldn't be appropriate to include them in the bill at this stage, given it will require wide consultation and quite an open discussion on that. And, and, and that this bill is not the place uh, for that. Um, but I do understand the points that are being made. And I think Malcolm Chisholm and Patrick Harvey talked about the landlord registration scheme um, that not being as effective as it should be. I do believe that there is sufficient powers within the landlord registration scheme um, to, for, for local authorities to enforce that, to have the powers to actually tackle landlords who are not operating effectively. And it, they do in some areas. That is happening. Patrick. I'm grateful to the v Minister for giving way. Notwithstanding the problems that some local authorities have with the resources they, they have available to enforce the landlord registration scheme, can the Minister give a clear principled reason why tenants of landlords should accept any lower standard of provision or service than tenants of letting agents. Why the disparity? Minister. 
As I said in my opening remarks, I have listened to what was said on all of these issues across the Chamber, and they will be considered before we, we come to the stage two and talk about these issues in detail. Today is about the principle, but I absolutely understand the point that Patrick Harvey is making there. And I do expect that the private sector, to, the regime, uh, to be t targeted and used more effectively. There was other points made um, from members. I think Patrick Hart raised the point in terms of um, no DSS and, and that kind of thing. The code of guidance, I want to be very clear, we would anticipate the code of guidance will cover all these ethical issues, it will cover financial issues, it will cover how uh, a, a letting agent actually operates. And we would hope that that would be publicised, that people would know and expect how a letting agent operates and also let us know when they're not doing it. And I can tell you other agents in the sector, the good agents out there operating, are very keen to let us know of ones who are not operating in the way that we would anticipate. We had a number of members, um, mainly the Edinburgh members, Mar Marco Biagio and um, Jim Eady and I think Sarah Boyack and Malcolm Chisholm all talked about the uh, City of Edinburgh Council um, asking for, for a number of areas um, in terms of repairing the, the repairing scheme. Now, some of those were not consulted on and ha have been raised now. Some of them we do believe, and we're open to further discussion in this, we do believe there's already existing powers to tackle some of these issues that were raised, and I'm more than happy to go into discussion with that when we get into the, the details of this bill. Mary Fee mentioned uh, today and yesterday about the energy efficiency. We have, yes, absolutely, we've got energy efficiency uh, me measures for the social rented sector, um, and it's right that they lead the way in this. But we don't need to put in the bill anything specific about energy efficiency measures in the private sector. We can already do that under the climate change uh, Scotland Act. So that's, that's already there. And I think Mary Fee is well aware we have a, a working group already set up to look at this and we intend to consult in 2015 on this. I'll take a brief interview. No, you won't. You're in the last 30 seconds. OK, sorry, I, I will follow that one through later. If I'm in my last few seconds, um, Presiding Officer, I'll just finish by simply saying I, I'm heartened by the support we've had over the Chamber uh, today for this bill. Um, I look forward to further discussions in more detail as, as the bill goes through the further parliamentary scrutiny. Thank you. So that concludes the debate on stage one of the House in Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 9578 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the House in Scotland Bill. And I call on John Swinney to move the motion, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, move formally, President Officer. Question This motion will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 9749 in the name of Margaret Burgess on the House and Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 9749 in the name of Margaret Burgess is as follows. Yes, 97. No, zero. There were 13 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 9578 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the House in Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. Mr Pearson, a point of order. I wish regarding this afternoon's members' debate, S4M 09191, Local Knowledge Under Fire. David Stewart's debate regarding the restructuring of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service would normally have benefited from a response from the Justice Portfolio. An explanation of the Minister's absence was duly offered. 
However, without further explanation, the Parliament heard solely from the Cabinet Secretary for Youth Employment. Is it within the role of the presiding officer to seek information from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice as to what other duty prevented his attendance at the debate to respond on behalf of the Scottish Government this afternoon? Can I thank Mr Pearson for the advance notification of his plans to raise this matter? This is not a point of order for me. It is entirely a matter for the Scottish Government to decide whom it is appropriate to represent the Scottish Ministers during parliamentary debates in the Chamber. That ends the business for today, and I now close the session.